I'm saying, kid, it's only right to represent where I'm from. East Coast, bomb line, but I represent wherever I go. I'll be on the West Coast, we be getting high with the fellas to perform the lie. For me, lose, big and tie. Every day, you know how we do. Ride, 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 I know Spig got my back, freaky toss off the charm giver. One, two, for my man, pretty new as I bless the rest of my New York City crew. As we continue to bring you the flame, representing LB from the cradle to the grave. Now, how's that? One time for your mind. When what I write down the line, give sight to the blind. I'm coming through with my clip. What you gonna do when shit gets thick? Is you gonna start your running and hiding? Is you gonna start to slip in the sky? Man, I thought you had this game in the smash. Well, how do it feel for real niggas in your ass? Mr. 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 Cheeks, freaky, freaky cop. Pretty, pretty loose. Speak his big, nice thing. One for the money, two for the lie. Three for my fools in the struggle getting by. Four, two, speak nice and freaky lie. Music makes me high. One for the money, two for the lie. Three for my fools in the struggle getting by. For my fans, two, speak nice, freaky lie. Send me off with this drug called the jack Put me in, gave me the sign to react on Whoever comes in my back To cut that ass a hat Make a feel the rap, yeah, yeah, all day And he volunteers down to lose their career Yo, we feels no fear Legal drug thugs coming through, that's the deal Beyond 9-5, well, we fan, keep it real It's hard as cleats, walking on the fucking streets Go now I walk peace, and even my wife cheats So I got to tally up and get it on, get it on Where he's going, where he's going, shit is on, shit is on I must represent for my fam Real niggas get rich, and bitch niggas scram To the day that I die, L.P. From the year 9-5 to 2G One for the money, two for the night Three for my people's in the struggle, get it All my niggas doing bitch. Uh-huh. All of my shorties on their own raising kids. Yeah. To all of my people who can't see that we made it. Niggas know the deal under real. This is rated. Put it to the left. Who's the first one to get it? Be your mind and stay the shock when I hit it. Run up on niggas who be fretting and shit. Hey yo, that's word of mine. Get that dies for my family. Nobody wants sin and nobody wants sound. Smoking cheese, hitting cheese. That's what we is all about. Try to put it on them for the year nine pounds. I represent my town, so I'm how I get down. L-O-S-T to the B-O-I-Z. South O's on group, on family. I'ma stay tree to the day that I die. Going pretty loose, big, nice and freaky tie. Hold up. Hey, yo. One for the money, two for the lie. Three for my people's in the struggle getting by. Four, you sing nice and freaky tie. Music makes me high. One for the money, two for the lie. For my people's in the struggle, getting by for my fam. Who sing nice, freaky vibe? Music makes me high. One for the money, two for the lies. Three for my people's in the struggle, getting by. Four, who sing nice and freaky vibe? Music makes me high. One for the money, two for the lies. Three for my people's in the struggle, getting by for my fam. Who sing nice, freaky vibe? Music makes me high. Right now, right now, right now. Listen, Brooklyn wins again. It's the 
dies to push them niggas again. Shot quality, mighty death, and that's died on the guest lock. Kanye, you the dope man at hip hop. Now let's rock and roll out, niggas. My hometown, niggas. I get it good in your hood, so slow down, niggas. Watch the speed, though. Mind your pedal and ease off. A screech off into a collision course with these walls. They don't move, don't break, don't lose, don't sleep. Life passes, life flashes, life happens that fast. Party done. Black hands up in prayer. Black guns up in fear. Dying wishes to touch the air. Seeking heaven, it wasn't here. Eyes will not see another year. It's another day. It's the same fight, different rounds. Sound the bell, mix it up in victory. You live it up, defeated, get risen up. You're knocked down and get back and get it up. Get off a queer street and get with us and get clear where we get it from the heart, from the people, from the top, from the deep, from the gut, from the street, from my soul to the mic to the essence. So in my absence, you feel the presence. Exactly. I make contact for sure to MC. Me and mine, we don't just get by. We get just to get by. Way. Nigga, I so cold. Nigga, I push lie. Carry the profile. Claim I was ready to die. Promise never to cry. Held it all aside. Reality was too much to take, so I kept my mind fried. Slept for most of mine. Soon as I closed my eyes, and I woke up behind. Thinking either I load up these nines or blow up with rhymes. Do this flow of mine is like blow up a line. So coca, and you folks think hope just wrote stuff to rhyme? Nah, I'm a poster from what happened. Seeing your moms doing five dollars worth of work just to get a dime. So pardon my disposition. Why should I listen to a system that never listened to me? Picture me working McDonald's. I'd rather pull a Mac on you. Sorry, Miss Jackson, it's but I'm back. It's about the way that it's my own piano flow. It's like a Michelangelo painted a portrait of my. Maya Angelo and gave it to a sick poet for the antidote. If music get you choked up, this is the tree and a rope. This is shy, nigga. I miss the all of that. Fuck a map, it's with this bitch on an almanac. Dice what they hitting for. Lacks what you sitting on. Tracks who you spitting on. Rap till we get it on. And don't let nobody with the power to sign. Ever tell you, you ain't got the power to rhyme. They used to tell me, toughen up, put some bass in your voice. They used to tell me, lighten up, put some bass in your voice. Lord willing, I ain't killed nobody But I have a feeling this album that I'm gonna make it killing Or now the shilling This is love and I hate the music But at least we made it music and we didn't make it industry This is gonna be interesting This'll be the end of me or I'm finna be your entity Kanye, Jay-Z, most deaf and quietly We are not making songs no yeah. more We're yeah. making history I
see the eyes, see the evil inside. The best people you find, stronger people than mine. I stay reading the sign. Yo, yo, yo. Psychopath and your girl Renee Black at you. Now, I mean, with another RBG pill show, what's really hood out there, family? Now, I mean, let me get some ones out there. Let's make sure y'all can hear me clear. Now, I mean, make sure I ain't got no technical difficulties. Things would just look a little crazy just a second ago. I was a little bit lost, wondering where that noise is coming from, but we good. You know what I mean? Let's, let's get some ones, though. Let's make sure we good. Let me get some shout-outs. Let me see. Shout-out to Rasheed. Shout-out to uh, G24Ds. Uh, Asia Baz. Uh, see, Back to Love. Aaron was good. To Chew. Uh, Stephanie. Lorvel. Charze. Mika. Uh, let's see. Shout-out to everybody else out there. Might be listening or slide through. Uh, yeah, my bad about Man Cave Monday family. I got tired and fell asleep. I ain't going to bullshit you. <laughs> I ain't going to bullshit you. I, yeah, I, I had a busy weekend. I, I, I crashed. I crashed. Woke up. It was late. I was like, ah, fuck it. You know what I mean? So that, that's on me. That's on me. So my bad for the man cave. Anthony Smith, what's going on? Know what I mean? But yeah, family, I'm waiting for Renee to come in right now. Because uh, we got some things we want to discuss. You know, a lot of things. You know, we was waiting for the last few days, like we was ready to go live on Tuesday. We thought a verdict could come in by Tuesday with the Kyle Rittenhouse thing. We figured Ahmaud Arbery would probably drag on most of the week, but we thought Kyle Rittenhouse should have be done by Tuesday. It wasn't done. We said, fuck it, we'll do it on Wednesday. Waited all day yesterday, nothing. Then we like, fuck it, we'll do it tomorrow. And here we is today. We waited all day, and again, nothing, right? So, you know, we just hanging out the drive right now. You know, they, they guys, you know, they guys hanging, hanging all out in the wind, wondering what's going to happen. And my initial thing with all these cases was, and that this is always my position going into these type of cases, is the motherfucker's going to get off, right? Uh, that's usually, I'm, I'm very pessimistic when it comes to this shit, type shit, right? Like, I, I'm i not a firm believer in the judicial system, right? At all, right? Not, I, that's just not me, right? So, I was sitting here and I initially was like, yeah, Amar Arbery is going to, uh, uh, Amar Arbery's killers are going to get off. Probably is going to end up being some bullshit, and motherfuckers might just turn up. Yeah, we'll get into all that in a minute. Then the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, and I remember I went, I, I said this on, I think it was Saturday, and that was my position on Saturday was Kyle Rittenhouse. 
is gonna probably get the fuck off. He's probably gonna get the fuck off. Shatera, what's going on? He's probably gonna get the fuck off and that was just my position because again, I'm very pessimistic when it comes to these things. But again, you're gonna get into all that in a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause you know, things tend to, you know what I mean? This is why I don't like covering these cases on an everyday basis and shit. I don't know how these motherfuckers do this shit on an everyday basis because pendulums tend to swing and change, right? Depending on the temperature of the room and shit, right? So you never know what the fuck might happen sometimes, right? Because you don't know who you're dealing with as far as dealing with these judges, the jury, <clears throat> and just how the evidence is presented within the case. Sometimes the prosecution makes a hell of a case and then sometimes they fuck it up. And then sometimes the defense don't know what the fuck they talking about and then sometimes the defense comes up and does a masterful job, right? So it, it, it's very hard to, uh, you know, get, okay, we finally got Renee here. Okay, it's very hard to find, kind of get a beat on all this stuff when it's happening on the fly. But uh, yeah, we got Renee in the building now. But yeah, Renee, what's going on? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. You know what I mean? Just give them a little, you know, breakdown yeah. of some of the effery. But we ain't, but I ain't even get into the effery yet. I was waiting for you <laughs> here. I didn't want to get too deep. I was just, you know, giving yeah. a skinny of everything that, you know, pretty much was going on throughout the week without telling too much. Because I was waiting for you to get here. But yeah, what's good? Yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. Um, yeah. Hey, y'all. Peace, y'all. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. Technical difficulties or whatnot. But I'm here. And yeah, so we, um, we've been gone for a little minute. Off the RBG Phil show. So we're back today. Um, I did a new intro and everything, but man, I want to... Yeah, kind of had to rush to get everything going today, but we we gonna work it out. We gonna get it together, or whatnot. But yeah, so y'all, um, like Psycho was saying, um, you know, we gonna get into this whole dig into this whole written house um, trial and the McMichael's uh, trial and their killing of Amon Arbery. Um, so yeah, we it's a lot to talk about with these two um, cases. Um, like Psycho said, he thought that it was going to come back pretty quickly. I wasn't so sure, but you never know. Like he said, you know, you never really know. And honestly, um, you know, in terms of how quick it usually takes, um, you know, so, like Psycho was saying, it can vary. But like in these cases, they usually go much quicker. So that didn't really happen yet. So anywho, we're going to get into it all because I think that you know, it's been so much going on. There's so many things that I want to say and talk about because, you know, we're used to, if you go back sometime, we're used to going live with the RBG pill more often. And so now, cause like the schedules are different and timing and things like that. So we can't do it as often um, as we would like to. Um, it's like, damn, I see so much stuff and so many things. And, you know, not in, not to like get at nobody or anything like that. It's not about that. But I feel like I don't know what's going on now because with all of the, the very serious things that are going on, I see so many people talking about stuff like the baby and, you know, just other things like, Jada Pinkett Smith and whatever is going on with her and Will Smith or whatever like that. And it's like, I think there's a time and place for that. And that's cool. You know, do what you do. But there's so, there's such a lack of like real, and when I say real, I mean real black news and information. You know what I'm saying? Not just stuff based on kooky, you know, yeah, no disrespect. <laughs> you feel me? But not just based on kooky stuff and 
all that kind of things that go with that, but just like real hardcore what's going on politically and what's going on socially and dealing with real facts and figures and numbers and and, and things really in, in, in black and white what's really going down. And I just feel like there's such a lack of that. And I just apologize for not being able to contribute more often because there really is, it's really missing out here. You know what I'm saying? And so just for people who may be listening, who have a voice you want to speak on these type of issues, definitely, you know, build your platform, speak out because we have enough with the whole entertainment thing and what Kanye said and Kanye, we got so much of that. And it's like right in front of our eyes, people are still not paying attention to, you know, what's really happening out here. So um, I just wanted to get my little rant, you feel me, my little spiel um, before we get into the show. But yeah. Okay, you ready to start off with uh, oh, oh, I got I'm put yeah. that thing I don't know, I guess you, I don't know. Yeah, so um I don't know, maybe my um I'll give you an echo. I might have to come in and come back. But or that's just your Obama uh your Obama laptop. Me. Obama was giving out laptops. Not me. Not me. Go ahead. I don't anyway. hear it no more, whatever. <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, so we can start. Um, we're going to start y'all with the My Arbory case and everything that's going on with that. Um, so the first thing, I'm going to get into this article. And this comes from CBS News, y'all. And what to know about the trial of three men charged with killing Amai Arbery? Um, the trial for the three men charged with killing Amai Arbery is underway in Glen County, Georgia. It took national outcry in a video of the attack for charges to be brought in the case. I want y'all to remember that. I want y'all to remember that. Um, 74 days after Arbery was shot and killed in February of 2020. Um, Arbery was black and the three men charged with his murder are white. Prosecutors say Arbery was out for a job when the suspects chased him through the neighborhood, uh, cornered him with their pickup trucks and shot him. Uh, The defendants say they thought he was a burglary suspect and that they acted in self-defense. Mind you, he had no weapon. Um, Their assumptions, prosecutors say, were false. In a 911 call by one of the defendants suggested the central role uh, race would play in the case. All of this and what does he say his emergency is, lead prosecutor Linda Donikowski Uh, told the jury, I'm out here in Satilla Shores and there's a black male running down the street. That's the emergency. Y'all, he called and said it's a black male running down the street. So, who is Amai Arbery? Amai Arbery was a 25 year old and was born and raised in and around Brunswick, Georgia at Brunswick High School. Arbery was a star football player known for his speed. Exercising continued to be important to him and was known to run often through the neighborhood. Okay. Ahmad wasn't a jogger. Um, I mean, excuse me, Ahmad just wasn't a jogger that was jogging in the neighborhood in South Georgia, his mother Wanda Cooper Jones said in an interview with CBS Mornings. Ahmad was actually my son. Ahmad was loved and Ahmad was loved by many. He worked various jobs after high school and had recently enrolled in the technical college. Um, How was he killed? We know. Let me just give y'all a couple things and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this. Um, How was he killed? Um, On February 23rd, 2020, Amai Arbery went out for a jog in Brunswick, Georgia. Travis McMichael called uh, 911 after claiming to see Arbery walk into an open home that was under construction in the Centilla Uh, Satilla Shores subdivision. Surveillance footage from the home shows Arbery walk inside, look around, and leave. Travis and his father, Gregory McMichael, armed themselves and chased after the 25-year-old in Travis McMichael's pickup truck. They said they thought he was a burglary suspect after a string of thefts in the neighborhood. A neighbor of McMichael's, William Roddy Bryan, joined in with his own vehicle and recorded cell phone video as they tried to stop Arbery. At trial, a police officer testified that Gregory McMichael told law enforcement they had Arbery, quote, trapped like a rat. 
Travis McMichael, who was armed with a shotgun, scuffled with Arbery in the street and then fired three times, hitting Arbery twice at close range. The shots created a hole in his chest and massive bleeding, according to the medical examiner, Dr. Edmund Donahue, who testified at the trial. Is there anything law enforcement or EMS could have done to save his life at the scene? Prosecutor Donikowski asked the medical examiner. I don't think so. No, Donahue replied. The suspects claim to uh, police that they acted in self-defense during the confrontation that resulted in Arbery's death. Travis McMichael testified that Arbery struck him and was trying to grab his gun. The disturbing video of Arbery's final moments, Phil My Bryant on his cell phone, drew national outcry. Um, an investigator later testified that Bryant said he heard Travis McMichael using a racial slur as Arbery lay dying, which Travis denies. Two and a half months passed before they were charged with murder and aggravated assault. Shortly after, the state began investigating and the video of the shooting became public. Um, just a little bit on real quick on who who are the men charged. Gregory McMichael, 65, is a former law enforcement officer who used to work as an investigator for the local district attorney's office. He is the father of co-defendant Travis McMichael. Travis McMichael, 35, is seen on video pursuing Arbery in a pickup truck with his father before getting out of the vehicle, scuffling with Arbery and fatally shooting him with a shotgun. He previously served in the Coast Guard as a mechanic and trained in search and rescue. Um, and William Ro- Roddy Bryan, uh, 52, drove a second truck that prosecutors said was used in tandem with Travis McMichael's truck to repeatedly box Arbery in. The cell phone video Bryan filmed of the incident is credited with the leading to charges in the case. He is a neighbor of the McMichael family. I'm gonna give y'all real quickly what the charges are. Count one, malice murder. Count two, felony murder. Count three, felony murder. Count four, felony murder. Count five, felony murder. Count six, aggravated assault. Count seven, aggravated assault. Count eight, false imprisonment. And count nine, criminal attempt to commit a felony. The three men are also facing federal hate crimes charges. In April, the Justice Department returned an indictment alleging that Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan used force and threats of force to intimidate and interfere with Arbery's right to use a public street because of his race. It also alleges that all three defendants attempted to unlawfully seize and confine Arbery and detain him against his will. After the murder trial in state court comes to an end, the legal saga will continue in federal court. The trial in the federal case is scheduled to begin on February 7, 2022. Prosecutors say defendants acted on assumptions instead of evidence. Prosecutors argue that defendants had no legitimate reason to chase down and confront Arbery. Um, yeah, they did it. These these defendants, this is what the uh, lead prosecutor said. All three of these defendants did everything they did based on assumptions, not facts, not on evidence. Uh, The state rested its case after calling 23 witnesses over eight days of testimony. They showed the jury graphic photos of the shotgun wounds that punched a gaping hole in Arbery's chest and unleashed bleeding that stained his white t-shirt entirely red. Due to the state of his wounds, prosecutors asked Dr. Ed McDonahue, the state medical examiner who performed Arbery's autopsy, how the 25-year-old was able to fight back after the first gunshot. Donahue called it a fight-or-flight reaction, which raised uh, Arbery's heart rate and blood pressure while sending adrenaline coursing through his body. The same police officer who testified about Gregory McMichael's statements to law enforcement read from a transcript of the interview that took p- uh, place at police headquarters hours after the shooting. Glen County Police Sergeant Roderick Nohilly, <laughs> Nohilly, okay, uh, Hillbilly, or like, anyway, told the jury he spoke with Gregory McMichael, who said Arbery wasn't out for no Sunday job. He was getting the hell out of there. With what? With with what though? Okay. Um, He later told police about shouting to Arbery. I said, stop. You know I'll blow your effing head off or something. I was trying to convey to this guy, we're not playing, you know. Gregory McMichael previously worked as an investigator for the local district attorney's office, which led to three local prosecutors uh, recusing themselves before the trial due to conflicts of interest. 
remember that, y'all, okay? Because remember, at first, they wasn't going to pursue this thing. Um, the Georgia Attorney General's Office has assigned the Cobb County District Attorney's Office to prosecute the case. In September, uh, former Brunswick District Attorney Jackie Johnson was indicted on charges of violating the oath of a public officer and obstruction of a police officer for her conduct in the murder investigation. The indictment said Johnson failed to, quote, to treat Ahmaud Arbery and his family fairly and with dignity by using her past work with Gregory McMichael as motivation to shield the men from charges. All right, I'm going to read this part and then we're going to get into this. Um, well, I got two more parts to read. Uh, the defense argues the men acted in self-defense. So let's hear about this self-defense thing, right? So the defense team is arguing that the three men acted out of self-defense and within the legal grounds of making a, quote, citizen's arrest. One year after the killing, Georgia lawmakers repealed the state's, quote, citizen's citizen's arrest law, which dated back to the Civil War. Interesting. They got in the truck to pursue Mr. Arbery for the purpose of detaining him long enough for the police to arrive to take over and investigate whether, in fact, he had committed any crimes, said defense attorney Franklin Hope. That turned from a citizen's arrest into self-defense, y'all. Now you going to arrest somebody and it turns from that into self-defense. You put yourself in a position of, okay, let me get Thomas McMichael took the stand in his own defense, testifying that he heard about, quote, break-ins in the neighborhood and had previously seen a black man lurking and creeping around a house under construction. When his father spotted Arbery on February 23rd, they decided to drive up alongside him and question him. Travis McMichael acknowledged under cross-examination that Arbery did not threaten them. Hmm. But as the confrontation ensued, McMichael said he was forced to make a split decision, life or death. Oh, you mean Arbery's life or death, okay. Uh, when he said Arbery grabbed for his shotgun, it was the most traumatic event of my life, he told the court. An attorney for one of the defendants also made a request to have the Reverend Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson removed from the courtroom after they separately attended court proceedings with Arbery's parents. Attorney Kevin Go, who represents or Gall or whatever, who represents Brian, said he feared Sharpton was trying to influence the jury, telling the judge. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here. Several days later, Gall, Gall renewed his concerns with respect to Jackson and requested a mistrial. How many pastors does the Arbery family have? We had the Reverend Al Sharpton last week. He added, there is no reason for these prominent icons in the civil rights movement to be here. With all due respect, I would suggest, whether intended or not, that inevit inevitably a juror is going to be influenced by their presence in the courtroom. Superior Court Judge Timothy Walmsley repeatedly declined to ask Jackson to leave and denied the request for mistrial. Courtrooms are normally open to the public. However, the judge has uh, instituted, I'm sorry, limited seating for the public due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the jury, this is the last part. <laughs> in a case where race plays a key role, only one black juror in 11 whites, and I want y'all to keep that in mind, okay? Keep in mind the jury makeup because it's, we gonna talk about the other jury makeup for the other trial too and, and just listen to the how it parallels. Um, in a case where race plays a key role, only one black juror and 11 whites were chosen to decide the fate, the fate of three defendants. State prosecutors objected, arguing that several potential black jurors were cut because of their race. Oh, really? The judge conceded that intentional discrimination by defense attorneys appeared to have shaped jury selection 
but said his authority to intervene was limited under Georgia law. In Glenn County, where Aubrey was killed and the trial is being held, Black people account for nearly 27% of the population of 85,000, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. The judge said 25% of the pool from which the final jury was chosen was Black, yet they have one Black juror. The lead prosecutor said many prospective jurors who were questioned in open court had expressed strong opinions about the case. A thousand jury duty notices were mailed and a pool of nearly 200 people were questioned by the judge and attorney at the courthouse. Um, so that was the end of that article. I mean, it really went into and broke down a lot of elements about, uh, you know, the trial and what's going on. And, um, you know, it, it's really, it's so many key things in this whole situation. And, um, you know, we did shows about this, you know, going back to last year and whatnot. Um, but remember, initially, there were no charges. Initially, um, the McMichaels were basically free to go. And it was only through, um, I believe the video got out. And after that time is when there was the call to action um, by the public, by the community and whatnot, um, in terms of this case. And if we were to really think about how many times that has happened that we will never know, how many cases, how many situations where something like this went on and the you know prosecutor's office just declined to, to prosecute or they said, oh, well, you know, it was reasonable. What took place was reasonable to occur, you know, no charges. Um, you know, even in terms of when you look at uh, what happened with the George Floyd case, you know, initially it was kind of the same thing. They were like, no, yeah, they wasn't gonna put any charges. They weren't gonna put any charges on those officers. And then even after that, they initially came with some really low, very low level charges. And, you know, that's what caused, you know, everything to kind of break out from that time. But this is a common thing that they do. And so you hear how in that particular county, um, the, you know, people who make decisions on these cases, the one judge basically said no. Like, no, she used her position in order to keep them, to help shield them from charges, to shield them from accountability for taking this man's life for no reason. And at the bottom, you know, the core of this and the Rittenhouse case, which we're, we're gonna, about to get into, is that you know, white men, white women, white people feel that they, because it was a white woman who shielded them, feel that they are able to be judge, jury, and execution. That they are able to determine whether or not a black person is able to live or die. That they can be the ones to determine that. And in the case of, uh, of with the McMichaels and the other dude, Brian or whatever, um, they, he recorded it. Like this is something that they was like, yeah. You know, they felt empowered by doing this. They felt that this was their duty as being white and doing what's right, taking this nigger down. They don't give a damn. Who cares about facts, right? Who cares about if he's jogging? Who cares about that y'all not no motherfucking police? Who cares about any of that? We white, he's black, and we gonna get this nigger. End of story. And then as it's so typical, right, it turns from a quote, citizen's arrest, which is some straight bullshit, right? It turns from that to, oh, we were just, it was self-defense. Right? We had to kill this one black man with no weapon on him. No stolen goods on him, no anything on him, but we had to kill him to protect our lives. We the ones with guns in the pickup truck, and it's three of us, it's one of him with nothing. But he gonna kill us though. 
and it plays upon so many, you know, different stereotypes and, and so much the, the typical white supremacist rhetoric, right? That the black man was going to take his gun from him and then kill him with his own gun. It's the same BS that you've heard in all of these other cases where you have actual police officers who have killed unarmed black men, women, and children, right? That they were going to somehow be unarmed, you know, their weapon would be taken from, from them, even though the black person had nothing. So you mean to tell me y'all that scared that even when y'all got guns, you that scared you just got to kill a black person right away because they might get your gun and then kill you. Why are you even putting yourself in that position in the first place? Oh, it's because you're white. And because you know the people and you know they're going to have your back and they did. And they did. It's just that word got out a little bit too much and then that's how things came back around to them. But otherwise, everything would have been cool. We would never be talking about this story. We'd never know about it. Somebody might have done an interview with uh, my Arbery's mom and she told her story and she cried and her tears would just go, you know, unanswered. Oh, well, this story happened, but you know, no charges were filed, you know? Oh, and they, they tried to do everything to um, destroy his, his image and his character, right? Which is what they always do, <clears throat> right? They attack the victim. And then, you know, I put a post up yesterday on Facebook. I hadn't put nothing on Facebook in so long, but it was a precursor to tonight's show. And my post was basically just talking about how white people um, are the biggest victimizers and love to play victim. And, and that's what the, the show is about tonight. You know, in these cases, you have where these people were in a position of taking somebody else's life, but now they're victims right? The McMichaels were victims of a my Arbery, right? They try to defend their life. They try to protect themselves from him. You know, and the thing about it is you will hear so many people, you know, talk about kind of this post-racial bullshit. They will talk a lot of this crap. And I mean, this happened in 2000, this was in 2020, right? This wasn't in 1920. Well, we know in 1920, this went down all the time. Like, it, it's no question. But this wasn't in no damn 1920. This was in 2020. This is a whole other 100 years later. And what's the difference? What's the difference? Oh, so now, you know, they up on these charges and they definitely gonna do some time, but they not gonna get no death penalty. I don't think, I don't even know. I don't think Georgia... I'll have to find out, but I don't think Georgia has the death penalty. I'm not for sure. But, okay, what? Okay, they're going to go to prison, finally. Okay. And this will happen again. And it's going to be more people that shielded and protected by these same systems. These same white supremacist systems. And then they try to sit here and tell you that you put race in everything. Y'all put race in everything. What you mean race is in everything? Their whole pursuit of this man was because he was black. Do you think it was some damn white boy jogging down the street? They would have done a damn thing. Hell no. They would have said, hey, how you doing? They would have tipped their head to him and kept it pushing. It was a man who did a, um, dang, I wish I would have thought about this. But I feel like um, last year we did a show where we showed this video. But this white boy did a, um, he, he did a, a thing trying to see what would happen to him, right? So he, he ran down the street. Yeah, that was last year, right after the, all this happened. Right, okay. And he ran down the street. I think one time he ran down the street with nothing. He did like three different things. The other time he ran down the street with something and then he ran down the street with a TV and nobody stopped him. Nobody came up to him. Nobody said anything to him. No police came, nothing happened. Because hey, who can, a white guy running down the street with a TV? Oh, that's reasonable, right? Oh, we'll see what happened was he was just, his brother lived up the street and he was taking a TV down to his house and he just decided to drop. See, they'll make up 
you know, it's, it's not even going to be a question in their mind that this white boy is a thief and he broke into somebody's house and stole their TV. And that's why he running down the street. And now it, it's not even going to cross their damn mind. And if it did, it's like, oh, no, he's he's probably just getting in and taking it over to his house. About, like, it's going to be some way that that's excusable and that they don't need to call the police about it and they don't need to be concerned about it. Because again, he's white. But see a black man doing that same thing, all them guns come out, baby. They jump in a pickup truck, they hopping, and Amon Arbery didn't have a mother freaking thing. He had nothing. And he went to somewhere, a house that's in, in under construction. Not that anybody was living in, not that any actual like real valuables, I mean, you could say construction type stuff, but they don't leave their, their tools and stuff like that around. So, so what was it? And see, we have to also understand that in the roots of law enforcement in this country um, is, you know, about the protecting of white property, uh, the protecting of property, the protecting of white people. And that's what, you know, law enforcement is built upon. It, it's not really about protecting, protecting and serve. Yeah, protecting and serving whom though, right? It's not really about no damn the community and the people of the community and making the world a safer place. And the, it ain't about none of that. The roots of it are protecting white property. Okay? And so anytime you see a black man somewhere where he not supposed to be, well, where somewhere he not supposed to be? Wherever white people say he can't be. That's where. Anywhere other than the projects, anywhere other than the hood, anywhere other than the ghetto, they say they can determine whether you're legitimate to be there or not. I don't give a damn if you own a house where they live. I don't give a damn if you own property. I don't give a damn if you own a business. It's still based upon whether they allow you to be there. Your ass need to get back to the projects. That's the only place we say you can be outright without our permission. Yeah, you can be in the hood. So the fact that he's even in a white neighborhood, you feel me? The fact that he's even there, it's like, this nigga? You know, you'll hear a lot from different black people who are homeowners in predominantly white communities and how they are treated, how they are mistreated, how they have the police called on them, how any and every little thing that goes on is analyzed. Uh, somebody parked out in the street uh, in front of their home, well, who was parked? That car was parked there. And oh, it seemed like they had people come over for a barbecue, we can't have that. So it doesn't matter. They have to be in a position to, you know, give you permission. Like, you got to get permission. That's why they feel they can roll up on him and be like, uh, excuse me, what you doing, nigga? What you doing? So, you know, at the end of the day, they're definitely going to do time. You feel me? Like, there's no way. Like, and the, the son took the, um, took the stand. And they say a lot of times that when people take the stand, it's like a kind of a desperation plea. A lot of times, um, they want to prevent the defendant from having to do that. Um, and wow, it was absolutely horrendous, like the son's testimony. And, you know, he was scraping and, and, and trying to find some reason to justify the pursuit of Arbery. Like he was trying so hard. Well, and I just thought it was kind of weird and, uh, so, I think a lot of things are weird. I'm not going and pursuing nobody. If you feel that strongly about it, call the police and keep it pushing. That's what y'all do anyway. That's what y'all do. That's what these Karens and whatever these people do anyway. So just call the police and let them deal with it. Oh, they was trying to detain him longer. Detain him for what? Detain him for what? Uh, 
oh, so he's black. Forgot. I keep forgetting that. Cause right, cause there's there's no like stolen items, there's no like weapons, there's no nothing, right? Yeah, the tail no cause he's black. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm gonna pass the mic to Psycho. Um, I think I did have one more thing I was going to mention about this um particular case. Oh yeah, I did have a um Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Psycho. I'm going to read this one, a little bit of this, because this talks about the son's testimony, and then I'm going to throw it to um, Psycho. So I wanted to read a little bit of this, and then we will... Y'all, I hate when they start playing these dang old videos, and you click on articles, like, really? Okay. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit of this. Um, this comes from CNN. Uh, Travis McMichael takes the stand and describes moments he shot Ahmaud Arbery. <clears throat> um, Travis McMichael, one of the three men charged with the murder and 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery's death, testified Wednesday he shot the black jogger in self-defense, saying Arbery attacked him and grabbed his shotgun. McMichael testified about the moments that led up to the shooting, saying he believed uh, he recognized Arbery from an encounter days earlier at a, quote, nearby home under construction. I want to give my side of the story, the defendant testified, saying later he came to be in a life or death situation. Uh, let's see. Travis McMichael was the first witness called as the defense began its case at the trial. Travis McMichael... Okay, let me get down to what he said. All right, early in the testimony, McMichael spoke about what he said was a rising level of crime, including vehicle break-ins in the Southeast Georgia neighborhood where he lived with his parents in the 18 months leading up to Arbery's killing there. Travis McMichael testified that on the evening of February 11, 2020, nearly two weeks before Arbery's shooting, he saw someone, quote, creeping through the shadows in their neighborhood and got out of his vehicle to ask what was happening. He testified the person who he later described to police as a black male, quote, pulls up his shirt and went for his pocket waistband area. Travis McMichael said he assumed the person was armed, so he jumped back into his vehicle and the person ran to the house under construction. You a damn lie. He testified he went back to his house where he told his father what happened. The two went back to the house under construction and called authorities. Police never saw, talked to, or caught the person. Travis McMichael said he saw that night he testified. You a damn lie. He was attacking me. McMichael testified that on February 23rd, 2020, he was in his living room when his father came in and said, the guy that has been breaking in down the road just ran by the house. Something's happening. Something's happened. I'm sorry. I was under assumption that it was the same individual that I saw on the 11th. Travis McMichael testified, adding his father told him to grab his gun. He said that when he got out of the house, he also saw a neighbor pointing down the road. During cross-examination from the prosecution later in the day, Travis McMichael said his goal when he uh, went out on February 23rd was to, quote, find out, to verify <clears throat> if it was the same individual I saw on the 11th. Wow. The father and son eventually got into their truck and Travis McMichael asked his father if he called the police, to which Greg uh, McMichael responded, yes, yes. But the son later found out his father did not have his phone on him, he testified. Y'all such liars. I recognize it is the same guy that I saw from the 11th, he testified. He tried to ask Arbery while still in his truck what was going on, trying to de-escalate, he claims, uh, the situation. He said Arbery did not respond, kept running, and he looks very angry. He looks very angry. The angry trope, right? Okay. He testified he tried talking to Arbery a second time, during which Arbery stopped, did not say anything, stood, but took off again after Travis McMichael said police were on their way. Don't nobody have to stop and talk to you. Don't nobody have to answer a damn question for you. Ooh, eventually, Travis McMichael said he noticed another truck in the neighborhood. Uh, prosecutors contend Brian, the third defendant, got in his own truck and joined the pursuit. Though he did not know what was going on and struck Arbery with his vehicle. Yeah, okay. 
you knew what it was. Because y'all know y'all racist as hell and y'all sit up talking about niggers and what y'all will do to a nigger. And y'all had a nigger and y'all was going to do whatever y'all wanted, including take his life. And that's exactly what y'all did. Uh, eventually, Travis McMichael said he parked his vehicle and saw Aubrey coming in their direction and yelled to Aubrey to stop where you're at and went to grab for his shotgun. At that point, Travis McMichael, Aubrey turned and ran back before eventually coming back again. Um, as Aubrey got closer, Travis McMichael said he drew his weapon on the jogger. Aubrey darted to the right and later straightens up and starts running back straight to the truck where my father's at the back of it. The younger McMichael testified he made his way to the front of the vehicle, which is where he first made contact with Aubrey, who he said grabbed the shotgun and struck, struck him. You a damn lie. I shot him, Travis McMichael testified. He had my gun. He had your gun. He had my gun. He struck me. It was obvious that he was attacking me. That if he would have gotten the shotgun from me. You said he had your gun. That if he would have gotten the shotgun from me, then it was life, a life or death situation. He testified he thought he shot Arbery twice before later realizing it was three shots when talking to investigators. Travis McMichael testified he shot him again after the initial time because I was still fighting. After the final shot, Travis McMichael said Arbery let go. I turned around. We got over there and pulled Arbery's hand under him and realized he was deceased, he said. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't even want to like I mean, it's just disgusting. Um, Like, I I can't, like, um, this is just, I'm sorry, it's just, this is just so disturbing. And like, they use the same old thing, right? Because if y'all remember back to um, Mike Brown, Remember how they were trying to say that Mike Brown was running into the bullets? Yeah, they always try to make it seem like he's superman. Right, we're su- we're some superhuman, you know, psychos into all the superhero things. Like we're some superhuman X Men or whatever people. Like we have all of these abilities, right? We can run through bullets. We can block bullets. We can reach over somebody shooting and take their gun and it's like, really? And it plays upon all of that, you know? And and then I just want to say real quickly, the angry thing, he looked very angry. As opposed to looking what? You got three hillbilly bastards roll up on you, questioning you, who the hell are you? I'm a grown man. I ain't got to answer nothing to you. Who do you think you are? And see, this is why, you know, we got to understand when I say a lot of these, you know, I've talked in the past about this, but a lot of these different tropes and stereotypes and the whole like angry, you know, they'll say the angry black woman and they say the angry black man too. And that's all about controlling black people's emotions, being able to control us. And the reason for that is because they know with everything that they've done to us and continue to do to us now, that it is most important to keep us under their thumb. So that's why they like to see you smiling. They like to see you cheesing. They like to see you going along with whatever they say. They like to see you when you're in agreement with them. They like to see you when you're, you know, turning your back on other black people. All of those things, they love to see it because it helps them to feel more comfortable. Because to them, their idea is, if man, I would be turning up, I would be taking out these white people, I'd be doing all this and that. If they had historically and continue to do all the things uh, black people had done that to us, I would feel like this because they, we know they rob, kill, steal, destroy, all of the above. So. They're thinking in that context. 
Whereas sadly, a lot of black people are not even in that mindset because we have been uh, allowing to a certain degree uh, white people to control our emotions, to control our reaction and our responses. We're overly cautious of that. You know what I'm saying? We will be more inclined to turn up with each other, but when it's these white people, we tend to get in line. We tend to, oh, um, yes, sir, uh, no, sir. Uh, you know, that's why when people say stuff about black people with the police, black people are being overly respectful to police. Black people tend to do that. Uh, yes, sir. Because uh, no, black folk already know. So we have to make sure we're not putting out an angry vibe. We have to make sure that we're watching our words and watching our responses. And so when he slid that in there, you know, that's to make a statement to this mostly white jury. That's to make a statement to other white people, you know, using that type of language that, oh, he looked very angry and that, and then the whole thing about, oh, he grabbed my gun and that type of thing. That's all to send messages to them because those are all things that they already think, feel and believe about black people. And that means you know, you were right and you were justified in killing that man because he looked angry and supposedly he grabbed for your gun, but yet you say he tried to get it. But you said he had, like, what? So anyway, I'm gonna pass the mic because I've been going for a long time, man. Yeah, go ahead, Psycho. Yeah, go ahead. Renee, Echo, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I agree with everything Renee was just saying. Um, you know, this this whole Ahmaud Arbery thing, we've been covering it since it first started and everything else, and here we go with the trial. I find it I, I find it crazy that they got both of these trials going on at the same time. That seems a little bit weird, but it's almost like they trying to distract you from what like they don't want too much focus on one, so they got them both running concurrently, and it just seems a little bit planned almost i'm sorry it just seems that way to me yeah i got my tinfoil hat on yeah but it seems that way but anyways because uh not nearly enough attention is being brought to this case not as much as uh the kyle rittenhouse case which is very you know it's, it's obvious why you know uh white people died opposed to a black person dying right a black person getting killed by a white person that's old hat right this then the Kyle Rittenhouse thing we got something completely different we're gonna get into all that though there's a lot to peel back from that motherfucker but um the Ma Arbery situation you know I went into this thing like I said earlier thinking that you know these dudes are gonna get off this fucking Georgia you know motherfuckers it's, it's, it's always some bullshit going on down there uh, in situations like this uh, so I went in there thinking nothing was going to happen these motherfuckers were going to walk until I heard these weirdos testimonies because these dumbass motherfuckers had the nerve to get on the motherfucking stand to testify now that was going against the defense code 101, right? Because the defense team does not want the motherfucker defended to get the motherfucker stand. That's usually not the case, right? Because usually nothing good comes from that, right? Usually don't want that motherfucker to hit the stand. Well, these motherfuckers want to hit the stand and they hit the stand and boy... They kicked their own selves all in the motherfucking ass. The defense, I mean, the prosecutor asked the proper questions, started asking the son about his previous history being down with the Coast Guard and started lining them up and asked him, like, well, wasn't you trained to be like an MP type motherfucker, whatever the case may be? And he was saying, yeah. And he was like, and in that training, they trained you for certain situations, right? Crisis situations, whatever the case may be. He was like, yes. He was like, you mind giving me the protocol? 
So he started running down the protocol of things he's supposed to do in certain situations, which is not have knee-jerk reactions, right? So he's running down all this shit and everything else and all this, all these protocols he was trained to motherfucking uh, obey. And within all these protocols, he was naming off. None of this shit was displayed the day that they ran into Ahmaud Aubrey. So he was killing his own motherfucking arguments when he took the fucking stand. Trying to show he was a good patriot, right? Well, in the midst of you trying to prove to everybody, all your little Trump trumpets out here, that you some kind of true patriot, you ended up fucking yourself on that stand because now you have no motherfucking excuses on why you did what you did. Because you are supposed to be quote unquote experienced in these type of situations that you claim was going on. Because it really wasn't no situation going on other than a Negro being black at the wrong place at the wrong time. Was no situation there that you motherfuckers didn't create. So not only did you create this situation, your overly trained ass was unable to deal with this situation that you just laid out all the protocols for on how to deal with. Like this shit was insane. And I'm listening to this weirdo and he's sitting here saying all this shit, digging himself a fucking hole. And I'm listening to this motherfucker like, yeah, yeah, this retard don't even know what the fuck he's saying right now. Like, who's this motherfucker's lawyer? And how is his lawyer okay with this? Because he's getting destroyed on that motherfucking stand right now. And, and he's too dumb to fucking realize it. Because you know he's one of these dumbass, low IQ European redneck ass motherfuckers, right? I think they smarter than everybody else. They think they smarter than a Negro just because they white. And they think they right just because of it. So he is dumb motherfucker just thinks, you know, I, I, I can say anything. No, you dumb motherfucker. Your ass about to get tore the fuck up. That motherfucker right there, the motherfuckers, they're done. They're done. After hearing that testimony, I have now changed my mind. I don't see, if that motherfucker walks now, after hearing that testimony that I heard the other day, yeah, they need to be rights going on. They need to turn the fuck up. They need to do whatever the fuck they need to do to get motherfuckers' attention to this bullshit that just happened. Because this is after hearing that testimony, this shit shouldn't take no week to deliberate. We shouldn't have a Kyle Rittenhouse situation. This shit should be open, shut case. Like, this is this ain't even a debate. So if this shit doesn't, if these motherfuckers don't end up fried after hearing that bullshit ass testimony, they should have been fried just off the footage alone. But after hearing this testimony, if they ain't fried after that, yeah, yeah, motherfuckers need to turn up. Motherfuckers need to turn the fuck up. And that's just what the fuck it is. That's just what the fuck it is. Straight up. Because that's some bullshit. Know what I mean? So I'm so we on wait and see mode with this. I got a little bit more confidence that this motherfucker is going these motherfuckers are going to get fried and if they don't again all hell needs to break loose. All hell needs to break loose. I, yeah, I said it. Straight up. 
So yeah, that's just how I feel about that case and what I've been watching over the last week. I've been watching a lot of court TV and court cases and live streams and shit like that over the last week and some change. I see Maurice up in the motherfucking chat. Shout out to him. That motherfucker been, he was live, he was live the last three days. That motherfucker was live outside the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, courthouse and shit. I, I, live outside, right outside the courthouse, at, uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse case. With all that madness going on out there, we gonna cover that shit too. It was a fuck shit. Matter of fact, I'm ready to get to Kyle Rittenhouse. Can we get to Kyle Rittenhouse? I really want to talk about this. Is this shit, yeah. There's a lot of bullshit going on. Let me know when you're ready, Renee. Unless you want to. I don't know. No, we we went in on the, um on my Arbery case, and it's more to come with that one. Kyle Rittenhouse, they are deliberating, so we should be knowing something soon. But no, let's get into it. Let's get in it. I'm ready. You ready? All right, cool. All right, family. Yeah, let's get to this Kyle Rittenhouse shit real quick, family. Because there's a lot of bullshit going on with this shit, too. You know what I mean? And I'm finding this one very interesting. On a whole bunch of different levels. And we going to tackle every level out there. Oh, yes. Yes, we're going we gonna to tackle it all. We're going we gonna to talk about all the bullshit that's been taking place the last few days. So let's get into this. And uh, yeah, we're going to play this clip. And then afterwards, we're going to come back and we're going to address what we just saw. I think Renee got an article or two she want to read. We're going we about, we about to peel back this onion. So let's get into it, family. About to play the clip and we'll be right back, all right? All right, let's go. Jurors were shown a key piece of evidence today in Kyle Rittenhouse's murder trial. It's footage of a man named Joseph Rosenbaum chasing Rittenhouse and throwing a plastic bag at him. Then moments later, Rittenhouse shoots and kills him. When people in the crowd pursue Rittenhouse, he shoots two of them, killing one. Let's look at this. Here's the video frozen just before he throws that bag. There's Rittenhouse on the left side running away and Rosenbaum holding the bag with his arm raised. See there? Rittenhouse did not fire the first shot you're about to hear. That was fired into the air by another protester. But he did fire the four that you hear after. Here we go. Come here. Oh, we got a gun, baby. Oh, they shot him. Oh, he shot him. He repeats, uh, I just shot someone over and over. And I believe at some point he did say he had to shoot someone. Seven days into the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, the state is finished presenting its case. And now the, defen the defense is building its case and calling its witnesses, one of which is expected to be Rittenhouse himself. CBS 58's Adam Reif is live outside the Kenosha County Courthouse to break down today's developments. Adam. Jessup, Natalie, good evening. There was a lot of movement in the courtroom today. A lot of witnesses testified, of course, and a lot of procedural issues were also decided. And for the first time, we saw a brand new drone video of the first shooting, giving the clearest picture yet of what happened that night. I began working on them on Sunday. Okay. When did the crime lab receive them? The crime lab received that as a submittal on Sunday. New drone video introduced by the prosecution provides one of the most comprehensive views of the scene so far. It was enhanced and cropped by a technician at the state's crime lab and shows Kyle Rittenhouse running through the car source parking lot chased by Joseph Rosenbaum. The crime lab slowed down this clip. It shows them running between parked cars. As Rosenbaum nearly reaches Rittenhouse, he spins and shoots. You can see the puff of smoke from the AR-15. The state played the clip several times for the jury then called to the stand a forensic pathologist with the medical examiner's office. This gunshot wound is a lethal injury. Step by step, he walked through the injuries suffered by both Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. The prosecution tried to determine how close Rosenbaum was to Rittenhouse when he shot him based on forensics and gunpowder residue on Rosenbaum's skin. I would say that in this particular instance, we're talking about something uh, within a few feet, within four feet or so. But on cross-examination, the defense focused on the angle of the shots. Your belief to a reasonable degree of medical certainty is that he's in a horizontal position close to my client 
the bullet goes in and across and down. That's correct. Okay, so once again, in the position of lunging would put you in a horizontal position, correct? It would. When the trial resumed after the lunch break. Your Honor, um, the state formally rests its case. Okay, uh, thank you. The defense called its first witness. Nick Smith described hearing the gunshots in the hectic aftermath and seeing a pale and sweating Kyle Rittenhouse sitting inside the car shop. I tell him to walk outside and turn himself in. That was a safe bet for him. And I told him to walk outside and he had said I had to. I had to shoot someone. For me, not for you. My understanding of you your... should have come and asked for uh, for reconsideration. You did on the one motion, and in fact, I granted your motion for reconsideration. That was excuse not our me, motion. I, I, I uh, not so, uh, excuse me. I, uh, I did. I granted. We did not move that to reconsider. That was their motion. I, I, we have I, not filed any me. motions to reconsider in this case. That was their motion for reconsideration, which I denied. But uh, I said I denied it or I indicated a bias towards denial is what I did. Held it open with a bias towards denial. Why would you think that that made it okay for you without any advance notice to bring this matter before the jury? You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post arrest silence. That's basic law, it's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. I step towards the Duramax and um, as I'm stepping forward, I believe his name is now Joshua Zeminski. He steps towards me with a pistol in his hand and as, um, as I'm walking, as I, as I'm walking towards to put out the fire, I drop the fire extinguisher and I, I take a step back. Okay. When you step back from Mr. Zeminski, what's your plan? My plan is to get out of that situation and go back north down Sheridan Road to where um, the car source lot number two was. And did you get back? Were you able to go in a northerly direction? I, I wasn't. Describe what happened. I, once I take that step back, I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side. Um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. Sir, uh, we're going to take a break uh, about uh, 10 minutes and please don't talk about the case during the break. What, read, watch, or listen to any kind of trial. Um, by the way, while we're waiting for the jury to come down, um, the media, somebody asked from the media, and I have no idea who inquired about the method of selection of those to be struck from the jury just now, this, this afternoon, this morning, whenever, this morning. Um, that's been the practice in this court for, I'm going to say, 20 years at least that I've been doing that, uh, that the defendant in a criminal case is the one who makes the uh, selections from the tumbler as to the jurors to be dismissed. So. 
So this right here is what the judge is referring to. Kyle Rittenhouse pulling out the numbers of the jurors who are going to ultimately decide his fate. I want uh, back to our top story, though, protesters are gathered right outside the Kenosha courthouse. They are awaiting a verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Protests outside the courthouse linger into the night. About 100 people marching through the streets tonight. As Nate Rogers reports, it comes after a wild day that included some arrests. A lot of activity outside of the Kenosha County Courthouse today. Protesters on both sides very passionate about the outcome of this case. And then around 4 o'clock, take a look at this video. One man apparently seen pushing a group of protesters. We're told that he was arrested by police after engaging in an argument with protesters on the steps of the Kenosha County Courthouse. And then earlier in the day, a man seen carrying what appeared to be an AR-15 style rifle and a bullhorn in front. He was heard calling Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization. The man was eventually escorted away by police. Now, throughout the day, more than 100 people have gathered on the Kenosha County Courthouse steps awaiting the verdict. Some waving flags, playing music and talking about the case. Representatives from Rainbow Push Coalition, Jacob Blake's family and Black Lives Matter were here. Also, many supporters of Kyle Rent Rent house claiming he had the right to protect himself um, my personal opinion self-defense is not a crime but I mean it's all about emotion right now I don't think it's gonna come down to facts anyway we're not going to allow democracy to be disrupted we're not gonna allow it to be hijacked we're not gonna let it be co-opted by people who want to exploit the fears and the large group of protesters continue chanting even after jurors went home for the day. On one side, folks saying free Kyle Rittenhouse. On the other side, folks saying no justice, no peace. We expect those protesters to return to the courthouse tomorrow morning. All right. And there y'all go, family. And there y'all go. You know what I mean? Y'all got to see pretty much everything that took place over the last week. And some change, actually a couple weeks, right? That was like a couple weeks worth of shit jammed all up into one. Just, you know, a little skinny. Get y'all. Most of y'all been probably keeping it up with it like everybody else. But, you know, just a little reminders of certain moments that happened throughout the course of this trial. And it's still going on. And, you know, they still deliberating right now, uh, the jury. And again, like I said, with the Ma Arby shit, you know, I initially went into this thinking that Kyle Rittenhouse was going to get off, right? They going, they going hit it with some bullshit as uh, self-defense bullshit, whatever the case may be, but he's going to get the fuck off. Well, seeing how long it's taking this jury to deliberate and being that they requested to actually view the video again in the middle of deliberations does not fare well for Kyle Rittenhouse. Each day that goes past that the jury does not finish deliberation is just more years tacked on to his life because I don't believe he's getting out starch free anymore either I think this jury's gonna find him guilty of something now how much time he does I'm not sure but he's not walking away scotch free Believe that, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Renee before I get too deep into this. But I'm, I'm gonna get deeper, family. Cause I got some shit I want to talk about, but I want to let Renee get in because I think she got some stuff she wanted to read and some other things. But still, go ahead, Renee. Okay, so I'll do a little breakdown and I'll throw it back. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I had a lot of articles that I'm gonna read a little bit from. Um, probably not the whole thing. 
but I hate when oh I hate when they do this um y'all know now they be trying to they be trying to give you the business on these um articles and stuff they honey they do not we want you to read these articles okay um so <laughs> which I understand oh, to some degree because the newspaper people don't really read newspapers like that so um okay is it gonna let me read it now or what or no okay so y'all i'm gonna read a little bit from this um new york times article um that is talking about um what's going on in the Rittenhouse case. Lawyers offer dueling narratives in the closing arguments of Rittenhouse trial. So I wanted to touch a little bit on like the closing arguments and that whole thing. I don't think I'm gonna read this entire article, but I'm just gonna give a few little tidbits here and there. And um, then we will go from there. All right, so let's see here. Uh, a prosecutor in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial began its closing arguments on Monday with an acknowledgement that the case has been clouded by politics, by feverish media coverage, by anger and outrage on both the right and the left. Look for the truth, Thomas Benger, the prosecutor urged the jury. So many people look at this case and they see what they want to see. Absolutely. Uh, Mark Richards, a defense attorney, echoed the sentiment in his own closing argument. This case is not a game, Mr. Richards said. Use your common sense and good judgment. Yeah, all right. Uh, the jury um, began on Tuesday to deliberate the fate of Mr. Rittenhouse, who was accused of first-degree intentional homicide and four other felonies. In the shooting of three men in the aftermath of protests in 2020, throughout the morning and afternoon on Monday, the panel of Kenosha County residents watched intently like the jurors had uh, through two weeks of testimony as lawyers delivered dueling narratives. Um, when graphic images of the two men who died and the third man who was injured were displayed on television screens, several jurors winced and looked away. They grew visibly tired as closing arguments dragged into the late afternoon, and at one point, the sound of chants from a small gathering of demonstrators outside could be heard inside the courtroom. Mr. Benger, over the course of a two-hour closing argument, tried to convince the jury that Mr. Rittenhouse had behaved in an ignorant and reckless fashion that resulted in the deaths of two people and the ma uh, maiming of another. Mr. Rittenhouse, who was then 17, came to downtown Kenosha with a gun that he was too young to legally purchase, Mr. Benger said. He lied about his medical credentials, saying he was an EMT when he was not, the prosecutor said, and when chased by a man into a, uh, un, into a parking lot, Mr. Benger said, Mr. Rittenhouse of Mr. Rosenbaum, who was unarmed. This is someone who has no remorse or reg no regard for life and only cares about himself, Mr. Benger said of the defendant. That's a fact. Um, Mr. Richard, the defense lawyer, described the events of August 25th, 2020, the third night of protest against a police shooting in Kenosha, repeatedly referring to Mr. Rittenhouse by his first name. Mr. Richard said the defendant had fired his rifle only because he was threatened by people in the crowd, beginning with Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum was shot because he was chasing my client, Mr. Richard said. Okay because he was going to kill him, take his gun, and carry out the threats he made. On the day of the shootings, Mr. Rittenhouse traveled to downtown Kenosha, which had erupted in protests that included looting and arson after a white police officer, Russ Sanchezki, shot Jacob Blake, a black resident. Uh, shall we remember seven times in the back? Uh, Mr. Rittenhouse has said he went to Kenosha to protect property and provide medical treatment, but things quickly got violent after someone near him fired a gun. The day of closing arguments began with a packed courtroom, uh, courtroom full of spectators, the first time in the 11-day trial that every seat in the courtroom was taken. Hannah Giddings, the girlfriend of Anthony Huber, the second man who was shot and killed by Mr. Rittenhouse, sat next to Carrie and Swart, Mr. Rosenbaum's fiance. Wendy Rittenhouse, Mr. Rittenhouse's mother, 
sat in her usual seat in the courtroom alongside her two daughters. Uh, let's see. Um, Judge uh, Bruce Schroeder of Kenosha County uh, Circuit Court and the lawyers debated the language of voluminous jury instructions on six uh, criminal charges that Mr. Rittenhouse had originally faced. The judge dismissed the least serious of the charges, a misdemeanor charge of illegally possessing a dangerous weapon as a minor. Wisconsin is an open carry state where it is legal for adults to carry firearms openly, but state law prohibits minors from possessing firearms except in limited circumstances. The judge sided with Mr. Rittenhouse's defense lawyers who argued that the language of the state law does not prohibit a 17-year-old from carrying a rifle with a long barrel as prosecutors had contended. That was out of here. Um, in a win for the prosecution, the judge told jurors to weigh some less serious charges along with the most serious counts they have been asked to consider. Giving jurors instructions on lesser charges can be significant. Legal experts say because the lesser charges offer jurors a path to compromise if they disagree on the most serious offenses. <sighs> for example, the most serious charge uh, Mr. Rittenhouse faces is first degree intentional homicide for killing Mr. Huber, 26. The judge uh, told jurors that they also had the option of finding the defendant guilty of second degree intentional homicide or first degree reckless homicide. Um, all right. And first degree reckless homicide, uh, basically under Wisconsin law, the crime is defined as recklessly causing death under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Um, Judge Schroeder read, let me see, I think it has a second. Okay, so counts two and three, uh, first degree recklessly endangering safety, um, basically means, let's see. Okay, I didn't break that one down. Um, okay, it's the finest causing the death of another human being with intent to kill that person or someone else. That would be first degree, okay, first degree intentional homicide. Um, okay, and then he has attempted first degree intentional homicide, attempted, uh, and that's in connection to the shooting of Gage Rosecruz, who was struck and wounded. Um, George Schroeder, or Judge, Judge Schroeder read 36 pages of instructions allowed to the jurors as the day wore on, including many references to the decisions jurors must make over the issue of self-defense. The instructions highlighted the complicated nature of the case and the many factors that and intricacies of the law that jurors must consider. At the center of the trial is the question of whether Mr. Rittenhouse was reasonable in his belief that shooting the three men was necessary to save himself from death or serious injury. Mr. Venture, the prosecutor, showed jurors a drone video on Monday that he said showed evidence that Mr. Rittenhouse had provoked the confrontation by pointing his gun at a bystander and prompting Mr. Rosenbaum to give chase. When the defendant provokes the incident, he loses the right to self-defense, he said. You cannot claim self-defense against the danger you create. Woo. Woo. Facts. Facts. The, the damn people in the, uh, uh, the damn lawyers in the, uh, uh my Arbery case. Y'all need to repeat that same line. Y'all need to repeat that same sentiment. Okay? When the defendant provokes the incident, he loses the right to self-defense. You cannot claim self-defense against the danger you create. Mr. Rosenbaum, who was five foot four, was no was no real threat to Mr. Rittenhouse. Mr. Benger argued, contradicting the defense's assertion that Rose, Mr. Rosenbaum was intent on taking Mr. Rittenhouse's gun, a cock quote cockamamie theory. He said, "That's the prosecutors called it a cockamamie theory." Uh, Mr. Richards at one point. Uh, made what appeared to be a reference to Mr. Blake, the man who was shot seven times by the officer and the Kenosha County District Attorney's decision not to charge Officer Shesky. Um, other people in this community have shot somebody seven times and it's been found to be okay, Mr. Richards said. 
adding of Mr. Rittenhouse and shooting of Mr. Rosenbaum, my client did it four times in three quarters of a second to protect his life. What the, I never under, what the hell is that supposed to mean? Uh, Miss, Mr. Richard says a group pursuing Mr. Rittenhouse, including those who gave chase after the first shooting, was, quote, a mob, a mob, y'all, intending to do him harm. Every person who was shot was attacking Kyle, he said. It's a tough choice, but the evidence only leads to one conclusion. That is that Kyle Rittenhouse's conduct on August 25th was privileged based upon the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum and others, he said, adding there are no winners in this case. What the hell do you mean? So that's all for that. What the hell do you mean there's no winners in this case? Y'all trying to make Kyle a winner? What you mean that he can sit up and kill two people and severely wound another one and he can just walk and just say, oh, it was self-defense, even though he created the dynamic and he's the one that had the gun. Right. Um, let me see. I may, I did have a couple other things to hit on because um, I want to get this all out the way. I did want to speak to a couple more things real, real quick. Um, so the judge, right? Because the judge... The judge's conduct has been despicable. It's been despicable. And when I tell you, they got it in for trying to get this dude off, like every every way possible. So I'm gonna read a couple of, a, a little bit of this article from NPR. Um, and then I'm going to touch on what the judge decided today um, something that happened and then I'll throw back to Psycho because he definitely wants to go in and out come back and get my breakdown. Um, all right, so this is from NPR. Um, As the nation awaits a Kyle Rittenhouse verdict, some raise eyebrows at the judge. Even to those who had never stepped foot in a Wisconsin courtroom, it was clear from the moment jury selection began that Judge Bruce Schroeder, the judge presiding over the state's highest profile criminal trial in years, would prove memorable. As the camera switched on and the live stream began for the first moments of the highly watched criminal trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 18-year-old accused of homicide after fatally shooting two people during unrest last year in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the judge uh, was playing Jeopardy with the potential jurors. Alphabet City for 600. I, it's the only major city that straddles two continents, Asia and Europe, Schroeder said. After a juror answered correctly, Istanbul, Schroeder had a follow-up. Okay, can you sing the song he said, drawing a round of laughter? <sighs> As Rittenhouse's trial has unfolded in the week since, Schroeder has alternately drawn cheers and criticism among legal experts and other observers of the trial. While some of his actions were inconsequential, others, including a strong admonishment of the lead prosecutor last week, could be pivotal to the trial's outcome. I think what people are surprised by is some of these little quirks, quote unquote, right? Maybe that they're not um, used to seeing in judges. There are all kinds of personalities that are on the bench all across the country, said Julius Kim, a defense attorney and former prosecutor based in Milwaukee who has appeared before Schroeder. Um, a no-nonsense judge. At 75 years old, Schroeder is the longest serving circuit judge in Wisconsin. He was first appointed in 1983. And to me, that's significant. He's 75 years old. Okay. Um, so, you know, he he's from a certain era, for sure, even though the era continues. Anyway, um, he was first appointed in 1983 by a Democratic governor and has continuously won election uh, since, often running unopposed. He has a well-earned reputation of being both no-nonsense on the bench, approachable, uh, said lawyers in Wisconsin. He tells a lot of stories and he focuses a lot on lunch. With the trial carried live on TV and internet streams, viewers across the country have been able to get an up-close view of Schroeder in action. On one day, Schroeder's cell phone rang with God Bless the USA by Stan, uh, or excuse me, by Lee Greenwood. On another, he cited Chaucer as he said, I do have a rule that is honored in the breach. A lot, although that line is actually from Shakespeare's Hamlet. What? Some viewers cringed as Schroeder struggled, as did lawyers and witnesses to discuss Apple's pinch to zoom feature and image enlargement algorithms after defense lawyers objected to a drone video that has been 
enlarged and enhanced by the state crime lab for prosecutors. Last week, Schroeder drew criticism for a joke some found racist about a lunch delay in court. He said he hopes for Asian food. Is it one of those boats in Long Beach Harbor? He said he hoped the Asian food isn't on one of those boats. Oh, okay, in Long Beach Harbor. Gosh. He's clearly stuck his foot in his mouth several times, said Chris Dacker, a defense attorney based in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's the old school judge who shoots from the hip and doesn't really think about how this is going to be perceived. A racist bastard, in other words. Uh, critics say he's been too hard on prosecutors. Some, especially those on the political left, have accused Schroeder of bias, pointing to several decisions in the defense's favor and his admonishment of the lead prosecutor in a heated moment last week. The judge excused the jury and then raised his voice to tell prosecutor Thomas Benger that his questions had threatened to undercut Rittenhouse's right to remain silent. Despite the criticism, several legal experts said they believe the admonishment was appropriate. The state was way over the line with their line of questioning. This is black letter law. It is law school 101, says Zachary. Yeah, whatever. Schroeder also drew criticism before the trial began when he ruled that prosecutors could not refer to those shot by Rittenhouse as victims. A loaded, loaded word, he said, while allowing defense lawyers to refer to them as arsonists and looters. As long as they could prove those people had taken part in those activities, how could that be proved? And let's be clear, weren't they victims? These were people who were killed that didn't have a weapon. So how are they not victims? Um, in terms of his legal rulings, I don't see that he's really favored one side or the other too much in my opinion, said Kim. Yeah, right. Um, so it, it pretty much goes on. It's like one little last part. Um, and I think it kind of talks about like he threw out the whole gun charge thing. So the judge has made um, definitely some key, you know, he's done some key things that that definitely raised my eyebrows that I'm like, it, it definitely seems he's trying his hardest uh, on Kyle Rittenhouse's behalf, um, that he's trying to help out the defense, in my opinion. Um, he's done a lot of little kooky things. He's done a lot of things, I feel like, that are distract distractions and deflections and to kind of downplay the seriousness of what's going on. Like when you're sitting there like playing games with the jury and you sitting here trying to make these dumbass jokes, you sitting here where your phone is going off with God bless the USA, you know, something that was pointed out that is played at all of Trump's rallies. Well, we know Cotton, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is a damn Trump fiend. Like he loves Trump. Like when we know, you know, what so much of this stuff is about and you sitting here, who, what judge does that? Who does that? When your damn ringtone goes off, your phone goes off and you on this high profile case, who's calling you? Who doesn't know right now? That's what I wanna know, who called? Who called? Because who doesn't know right now being in the position you're in, and I'm pretty sure everybody don't just have a judge's number. Who doesn't know that right now, you on the bench, you presiding over a major, major national, international case right now? Who doesn't know that? Like, this is absolutely insane. So I feel like it was definitely, you know, some things put on there. I, I got my tinfoil hat on too. You feel me? Like, yeah, it, it's some stuff going on for sure. And um, I agree with some psycho said earlier about these two cases going on at the same time. I agree with that. Like, I got my tinfoil hat on. Like I said, like, yeah, that there was some kind of arrangement there because it helps to diffuse it, right? So it's not, so one is not going to get, it kind of splits the focus. It splits the focus. And to me, that kind of brings the energy down some because if it was just one singular case, everybody could solely be focused on that one case. But because there's two, it kind of split, it divides things. And so because of that, I think it, you know, 
people wouldn't be as passionate if it were just one. Um, so I, I definitely think that was intentional um, as well. Um, let me see. I think it was one more thing I wanted to mention and then I'll go to Psycho. And that was basically, um, so the judge decided today that um, MSNBC is banned from the courthouse. Uh, so basically it was alleged that there was um, an M- MSNBC like um, freelance, they freelance for MSNBC. And um, supposedly they were trying to get pictures and or video of Rittenhouse or a jury, the jury. And supposedly they were following the jury van, um, you know, this got back or whatnot. And so then they banned MSNBC from the courtroom. And MSNBC said, we regret the incident and will fully cooperate with the authorities on any investigation. Um, yeah, so to me, that's just another, that's just another part in this that is uh, beneficial to the defense. Think about it. Think about it, right? Because everybody knows MSNBC is like a liberal, um, a, a liberal channel. And so in this particular situation with Rittenhouse, he was not accused, but he's guilty, I don't give a damn, of killing some liberals, right? Killing these white liberals. And so in terms of, okay, well, MSNBC was trying to, a freelancer from them, right? So this is not even somebody who actually works for them per se, they freelance and, you know, they may pick up this some of this person's videos and photos or whatnot. Um, but we just gonna bar MSNBC altogether. We're not gonna say the freelance, this freelancer can no longer come. We just gonna throw MSNBC out altogether. So I think that's significant. And the intention is also to make a point. Um, MSNBC, in a statement, MSNBC confirmed that a freelancer for the cable news network received a traffic citation, but denied that he was trying to photograph jurors. While the traffic violation took place near the near the jury van, the freelancer never contacted or intended to contact the jurors um, during deliberation and never photographed or intended to photograph them, MSNBC uh, said. Uh, we regret the incident will fully cooperate with authorities on any investigation. So yeah, basically, so that's just another, to me, another little thing thrown in there at the last minute you know, they already deliberating. It's already seemed contentious because they had to go back and watch video and get more instructions and different things like that. So I think that was highly, highly um, intentional. And lastly, I will just say that in most court cases um, that have, you know, that deal with this type of thing, it tends to go a lot quicker. Uh, so this is not really looking good in Kyle's favor. So um, to me, that's, you know, him helping them out. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, in the nationally watched Casey Anthony and Derek Chauvin trials, the jury only took 10 hours to come uh, to a verdict in each case. Not guilty for Anthony, the Florida mother accused of killing her young daughter in tw- uh, 2008, and guilty for Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer convicted of kneeling on and killing George Floyd uh, last year. In the O.J. Simpson trial, which took 253 days and included 156 witnesses, jurors took less than four hours to find Simpson not guilty. And that was because of black women. Let me make that clear. Um, there is no maximum for how long a jury may deliberate. In 2006, the Texas jury took nearly 38 hours across seven days to convict the Reverend Terry Hornbuckle of sexually assaulting three women. In 2003, a jury in California took 55 days to acquit three police officers, of course, of charges for assaulting and falsely arresting people in some of Oakland's poorest neighborhoods. In that case, not guilty verdicts were found on eight charges and 27 of the charges ended in deadlock juries. Um, In 2012, a jury took more than 20 hours across two days to convict now former Pennsylvania State 
University football coach Jerry Sandusky of sexually assaulting uh, um, 10 boys. Um, so yeah, uh, on average, on average, it doesn't take that long. Um, and also now they're trying to talk about mistrial, um, which I think is what they want. I'll read this little part real quick. Um, in the Rittenhouse case, the deliberations were either further delayed as attorneys and Judge Bruce Schroeder debated Wednesday about where jurors should be allowed to review footage of the shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum, who died in the August 25th, 2020 incident, and how many times they should be allowed to review it. And the possibility of a mistrial looms over the proceedings, which could render the last three weeks of trial moot. So let's also understand that's a real possibility. It's unclear to all except those 12 jurors if they have come to a verdict on any of the five charges Rittenhouse faces as they are tasked with reaching unanimous decisions on each. Ooh! They have to have unanimous decisions on each charge. As such, a hung jury is possible for some of the charges while a unanimous decision could be reached on others. Um, all right, so yeah, I'll throw the psycho. Um, so you can go. Yeah, yeah whoa, yeah. Renee, I don't echo. Yeah, you got to give me a chance to mute my line. Like, okay, 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 yeah, um, yeah. It, it, yeah, y'all, y'all just heard all that. You know, I know it's a lot to chew on. Uh, like I said, a lot of people should have been keeping up with all this and everything. And um, yeah, um, I was jotting down a couple of things I wanted to address. Um, let's see, shout out to Kelly. Appreciate the super chat earlier. Um, I believe she said uh, free cow. Uh, I think she said something about he uh, he took out two trash bags. Um, and you know, I, I hear this a lot from the right. You know, uh, you know, Cal. Let, let, let me start with saying this, family. You know, let's not forget this is white on white crime. Ultimately, this is white on white crime, and I'm about to peel back all this onion, right? But I want to address the talking points that I hear a lot, um, especially the one from the right about them killing, uh, killing two trash bags. I forgot what the other dude is accused of, but I know the dude that he first dude that he killed. Uh, was accused of, uh, I think he was a, not, I think he was a convicted pedophile. He might have been a convicted pedophile or something like that. And uh, he had pedophile charges and everything. So, um, yeah, you know, we don't support pedos over here at all. You know, so not, not at all. So, you know, dude's a pedophile, you know, then he should have been dealt with by the law. And being that he's a, a convicted pedophile, I'm assuming he already got convicted and i'm assuming he did his time for that already or else he would you know still be in jail unless he's unless he escaped from jail or something and he was out there i would assume he did his time for that i'm not making excuses for a pedophile at all I'm, but let's also get this clear about the pedophile thing too because this is always left out whenever the pedophile situation is brought up Kyle Rittenhouse did not shoot him three to four times because he was a pedophile that's not why he shot him like bringing up the fact that he's a pedophile is like after the fact right that's like after the fact we gotta find something in his past to make it seem justifiable uh, why he dumped bullets all up in him. I.e. he was a pedophile in the past. He deserved it. Right? Like, you know, trying to put this off on karma almost, right? And people do this with black people a lot. People do this with black people a lot. We, we get this all the time. Mike Brown, anybody? Them motherfuckers brought Mike Brown history like a motherfucker. He had no problem doing shit. George Floyd. We got to go all the way back to Mike Brown. George Floyd. We talked about his motherfucking history and everything else. Like, But none of these situations have anything to do 
with what happened to them in the past, right? Like, and I, again, I'm not, I don't support pedos, but a pedo still deserves their day in court. And being that we know that he's a pedo, it seems like he already had his day in court. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what else to say with, when it comes to that part. You know, now, let, let's get to the whole Kyle Rittenhouse thing, right? Now, you know, they, they say, you know, um, everything, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of, uh, you know, people always talk about, you know, the, the problems in the black community and all this other shit and everything else. And, you know, you hear a lot of red pill motherfuckers talk about the single black baby mothers is the problem and how they so out of control and everything else. But uh, let's not forget this is the product of a single motherfucking mother that we talking about here. Right? The product of a single motherfucking mother, a white mother from a white daddy that's in this situation. Right? I just wanted to throw that little nugget out there for the people that like to, you know, always throw up black women and single baby mothers. You know, they act like single baby mothers is exclusive to black women. But, you know, you let other motherfuckers call it, you know, that's just what it is. That silly ass notion. But, how the fuck, right? You got this whole situation where, like I said, this is a white on white crime situation. You know, white boy going ham, shooting up a bunch of other white boys. And I'm watching all this shit play out, right? And the entire time I'm watching all this shit play out, I'm seeing motherfuckers on the right and motherfuckers on the left in certain black people every fucking way. Black people ain't got shit to do with what happened that motherfucking night outside the fact that they was protesting over a black man being paralyzed by some racist ass pigs. But as far as this night goes specifically, this is white on white crime. But somehow or another, I'm seeing white motherfuckers talking about black on black crime telling us to go back to Africa talking about how the Irish were slaves too not me got all this smoke for the black community and I'm sitting here like Kenosha looks like a whole motherfucking white ass motherfucking community I don't know I ain't never been there but just judging from what the fuck I've seen it don't look like there's too many Negroes up in there. I, I could be wrong. It just don't seem like the Negro population is very thick. Up in fucking Kenosha. And I, I and being the fact that all I kept hearing, because I watched a lot of footage of the protesting shit going on outside. Again, Mo and Kelly was out there. And they was up, they was live on their channels. I was over there watching all that shit, like hours of this shit. And I'm listening to all these motherfuckers out here, right? The right and the left. I'm about to get on both these motherfuckers. Because all these motherfuckers is dirty to be. I'm about to clap with all of them. Right? But right now I'm on the right. Let's stick to the right right now. I'll get to the left in a minute. But the right winging motherfuckers, these motherfuckers. Every motherfucker's talking about Chicago. This shit ain't even take place in Chicago. Chicago is in a whole different fucking state. I don't give a fuck how close Chicago is. That is a whole different state. We ain't gonna get some bullshit. I live 20 minutes away from fucking New York. 20 minutes away from New York. I ain't going, we don't get this shit out here in Jersey and everything else and they start blaming New York, man. What the fuck, what? No, but we didn't happen in Jersey, dog. What the, the hell are we talking about here? Y'all bringing up a whole different state. 
to justify y'all white on white crime. Bringing up a whole different race of people to justify your white on white crime and use us as your boogeyman. Literally, I am witnessing this. I'm seeing all this, right? I'm like, this is interesting. This is interesting. We don't have a black male shooter. We don't have the black female shooter. We don't have a black child shooter. We don't have any black victims anywhere. But everybody out here talking and screaming about Chicago.
every time you weirdos espouse that dumbass right wing talking point that don't hold no fucking water. Y'all have to stop this. It, it has to stop. Stop calling these motherfuckers. Stop giving these motherfuckers more credit than they fucking deserve. Please. That shit drives me fucking nuts. Seriously, though. But, the, and, the, and to prove my point, that BLM ain't nothing but a bunch of fruity ass Lesbo, motherfucking intersectionality, feminine ass weirdos. I can prove it. About, oh, you think I can't prove it, motherfuckers? Like I said, shout, shout the boy Kelly in them again. Because I have been watching all this fuck shit that's been going on out here in this motherfucking shit. And look at what the black people had out here representing in front of the courthouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm looking at their live stream. The motherfuckers pendled up to the fucking stairs so I can, so, so the people can see the protesters that was there on the left. And this is what the fuck I saw. This is your terrorist group right here. A, a fake ass mother. You got a European here holding a cup of coffee. Cold as shit. Another European on the other side with another cup of coffee. Then you got these Negroes in the middle. That one of them looked like a straight up lesbian. Then you got the sad, the most saddest, pathetic sight is this motherfucker waving that RPG flag. I, this is this is what triggered me the most. This weirdo is waving an RPG flag, and it's another motherfucker over here with an RPG scarf on. Now look at the motherfucker in the middle of those two RPG motherfuckers. What is he over there holding? What is that weirdo in between that RPG shit holding? Can somebody please tell me? Is that a motherfucking... Oh, damn. Oh, fuck. You are gay. Why? Why? Why is that Negro out there with a rainbow motherfucking sign. Right between two other Negroes wearing, waving some RBG shit. I look, I'm looking at this shit disgusted to the high heavens. But this is what the fuck is out there. This is your terrorist organization that you pussified as conservatives be shook up of. A bunch of fruitcakes, lesbos, and some intersectionality Negroes with some Becky girlfriends. Because some of those Negroes rolled out there with some Beckys I saw. I saw them. They was out there with some Beckys. And then try to wave a RBG flag. This shit was pathetic. But y'all call these motherfuckers terrorists. And y'all wonder why I laugh every time you motherfuckers say that shit. This is why. This is why I laugh. This is why it is funny as fuck to me. Please don't disrespect true terrorists by just throwing that shit around to everybody. What are y'all doing? 
What are they doing? What are these motherfuckers doing? That's the better question. This motherfucker was waving it. I mean, and, he, and they was out there for about three, four days. Three, four days, same side. Same side. And I'm like, what is the fuck is going on out there? They out there trying to argue with all the white people and everything else? With they kumbaya talking points and shit like that? There was this one dingy, dusty, motherfucking dingy, dusty, trailer park redneck out there. Every racist as fuck, old ass motherfucker racist as fuck was out there every day, no lie, since Monday with the same dingy, dusty ass motherfucking hoodie every single fucking day that motherfucker got to stink that motherfucker must have been reeking out there i saw that motherfucker out there today that motherfucker was out there with a sign trying to antagonize people talk the sign said black crime matters and he was out there trying to antagonize the people and I'm like, yo, I know you ain't out here trying to antagonize motherfuckers with a sign that says Black Crime Matters. With that dingy ass hoodie on, smelling like Monday. You ain't changed that motherfucker since Monday. You out there smelling like Monday. Shout out to Pookie, appreciate that. You out here smelling like Monday morning. You out here talking this black crime shit matters. Motherfucker, white detergent matters. White detergent matters. Wash your shit and stop violating everybody's nose hairs. You dingy, dusty, smelly, funky ass redneck. Pick a wood, motherfucker. See, I I should have been out there. Because I would have had all the smoke. I would have had all the smoke. All the little racist ass talking points I was hearing all weekend, all week and shit. I was like, man, this shit is. And, and they hear the Negroes trying to talk back to that shit. They, they on their Martin Luther King. We all the world, we all, we, you know what I mean? We all the world fuck shit. Trying to have group hugs and all that shit, man. Fuck all that shit, y'all motherfuckers. Fuck it. Motherfucker, put that, give me that damn flag. You don't know how bad I just want to jump through the damn camera and say, give me that motherfucking flag. You motherfuckers embarrassing us. Give me this goddamn flag. Give me this flag. Give me that Revolution fucking spark. This is embarrassing. Take up the gun. Peace, virtuous woman. Shout out to you. I appreciate that. That is embarrassing. What are you Negroes out here doing? What are y'all doing? Why are y'all even out here? Let like these white people fight these fights, man. These white liberals can handle that shit. They motherfucking self. Let like these white liberals handle this. A white liberal. White conservative fight, let these fuckers have let them do what the fuck they do. Take your black ass home. What are y'all doing? Let them fight, they fight, man. It's they fight. Let them fight that shit. What the hell are we talking about over here? Right? Well, I'm like, yeah, man, what is this? What is this? So this, uh, that whole shit was just like, God damn. What the hell is going on out here? I see, man, I couldn't have been there. I could have been there. It would have been turned up. It would have been turned up because I, I, yeah, especially that one old motherfucker, I, he would have had to get that work. Because he was try, he was looking for the smoke. Oh, he would have got it. He would have got all the smoke. 
It'll be showtime and the Apollo up on that motherfucker in Kenosha. I done roasted the shit out of that motherfucker up on there. He didn't want that smoke. Oh man, I was like, oh, this is this bad. This is bad. They ain't got the right Negroes out there. They ain't got the right Negroes. They need some motherfuckers who got that smoke, who looking for that smoke. God damn it. Tired of seeing us embarrassing ourselves in these situations, man. Stop that shit. You gonna be out there, man. Be with the shit. Or take your ass home. The hell is y'all doing? Sitting up here playing games. You can't go all the way because you got a goddamn Becky for a girlfriend, so you can't do you ain't but so much you can say. You can't go certain places. Cause your Becky gonna get mad at you. This, 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 why, why are y'all there? Why are y'all there? Waving a whole RBG flag going home with your Becky. This is, this is, this is, fuck. Y'all motherfuckers make my hair hurt. Y'all motherfuckers make my hair hurt. Anyways, I'm sorry, I had to get that out. But let me, let me, let, let me say, let me say, I'm about to pass it to you real quick today. Let me just say, the lottery shit, was weird as fuck. I felt like somebody, I, I felt like Kyle Rittenhouse was the number one draft pick in the white supremacy motherfucking draft of 2021. And he was, they, they was, they, he was picking to see which team was going to get a chance to pick him. Know what I mean? I felt like motherfuckers was, was, was tanking for, 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 for Rittenhouse. They was tanking for Rittenhouse. They was fighting for the number one pick. That shit felt, that shit was weird as fuck. Like, what are y'all playing, bingo? I ain't never seen this shit in the courtroom day in my fucking life. They said they done it in the past. Okay. It doesn't make it less weird. It doesn't make it less weird. It just doesn't. And, 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 and uh, and, uh, let's see, what else, which, what else I wanted to touch on? I touched on that, touched on that. Yeah, I touched on that rainbow kush fuck shit. I think that was the name they said the organization Rainbow Kush. I'm gonna look them fuckers up and not pause, pause. But I'm gonna look some motherfuckers up and do some background searching on these Rainbow Kush motherfuckers and find out who they affiliated with. There's some fuck shit going on with this RBG fake ass. Man, listen, I, I'm disgusted. Anyways, and uh, oh, last thing the fake client. The fake ass motherfucking crying that Kyle Rittenhouse did, that shit. Stop it, dog. Stop it, dog. You can't be up here bawling your eyes out while motherfucking white people are out in the fucking streets trying to make you the new Chuck Norris. White people are out in the streets trying to make him the new Chuck Norris. And this punk ass motherfucker up in the goddamn stand, bawling his fucking eyes out. Pressed in a motherfucker. Like, this is your new Chuck Norris? This the new Chuck Norris, huh? Uh huh. Got it. This the, this the new Ronda Rousey, huh? This the new Ronda Rousey? Uh huh. Got it. Who is this? Who is this guy? I mean, I don't know these. Is this the, is this the new O'Connor? Is this the new O'Connor? Who, who is this guy? Who, who, uh, 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 who is this? Who is this guy? This ain't the new Chuck Norris. This motherfucker over here balling his fucking eyes out like a uh, what? Balling his eyes out like a little well motherfucking uh. A uh, little motherfucking kid, uh, uh, runway model or something, and he needs backstage mama to motherfucking go motherfucking the, the rub his head and shit, and tell him it'll be all right. Motherfucking single mother in the fucking audience. You know what I mean, they got one of those stage mothers. Kyle Rittenhouse, a goddamn one of those little motherfucking little child models and shit. And, and his mother, one of those back, one of those uh, stage moms and shit, patting him in the head and shit. He over here bawling his eyes out. And somebody broke his tiara. 
You don't get your punk ass out of here, fake ass Chuck Norris. Wait, Chuck, fuck on your mind. Chuck wouldn't be on the goddamn stand crying his ass off. You can't call him Chuck Norris. You can't call him Chuck Norris. I ain't never seen Chuck Norris bawling his eyes out in no movie. Y'all gotta find a new Chuck Norris because he ain't that. But he ain't that. Sorry, he ain't. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Renee. I'll be yapping off for a second. Go ahead, Renee. My bad, bro. No, you good. You good. <laughs> but yeah, I want to point something out. Pay attention to like how much the views that drop down. First of all, pay attention to like the views was already less today because of what we're talking about. And then like when Psycho started really going into the Kyle Rittenhouse thing and breaking this stuff down, see how things went because people don't really want to talk about these kinds of things. And also because, you know, whenever you re we really get on white people's head like that, and we always do, people can't take it. And that means the white people that be in the clouds listening, and that means other black people other black people that be in here listening too. They don't like to hear that because a lot of them come from these um, humanist type positions as well. They come from these MLK, I have a dream type positions as well. And we can all be as one and, and all of that kind of stuff. So they don't want to really hear uh, real deal, hardcore like commentary, you know, on these types of issues. And like, that's just where we at today. And it's just, it's a sad state of affairs. And somebody was in here earlier, some white boy or whatever, talking about some damn, um, back to love got him, talking about some damn, um, we keep, we, we keep killing each other. What? What in the hell? First of all, we keep killing each other as far as who? What are you talking about? As far as like homicides or whatever, all races kill their own people more than anything. So what does that have to do with anything? We talking about the Amal Arbery case where a black man was viciously, brutally murdered by three white racist bastards that ran him down, ran him down and as they say in their own words, trapped him like a rat. An innocent man. And we talking about Kyle Rittenhouse and his white on white crime where he done killed two other white boys and then severely wounded another. So where do you get this? Where's black on black crime at in this? What does that have to do with anything? And they gonna talk, talk about, uh, we got single parent homes and until we have homes with, with two. But I love that whoever that was put that comment in the chat because it really highlights something that we talk about a lot. You know, consistently, whenever you bring up racism, white supremacy, and you bring up the reality of the social and political conditions and economic conditions of black people, the very first thing you will always hear is, we all know it, say it with me, what about black on black crime? Like, what? It's gonna be that, it's gonna be some BS about single mother homes. What does that have to do with anything? We are talking about the system. We are talking about what goes on to black people all the time. How these MS wasn't even gonna be charged in their killing of Amai Arbery. They was not even gonna get any charges at all. Like we talking about the reality of this system and the fact of the matter in terms of the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, that was white on white crime. We don't give a damn about, oh, they took this person's life or whatever, that's on their community. We're pointing it out in terms of a couple of things. Number one, in terms of how the system operates, that they can dictate when, how, where, why, they wanna do anything that you can have a judge up here doing the antics that he's doing, that you can have people sitting up here talking about he's, he, he was acting in self-defense and he was the one with the gun. 
and he was the one that drew first blood. He was the one didn't have no damn business out here. We point now how, had Kyle Rittenhouse been a 17 year old black young man, it would have been a totally different story. All we would have heard about was, he's from a single mother home. Where is his father? He used his damn government welfare check, his, as y'all call it, um, his stimulus check to buy an illegal gun. He went somewhere he had no business going did something he had no business doing and the law enforcement let him do it. And then they let his ass walk away after he had killed two people. So that is what we're speaking to. That is what we're drawing attention to. And now how they can change and shift the narrative to what they want it to be. It ain't about the white on white crime element. It's about what this means systemically. If they doing this, then we already know what they do to our people. So we gonna point it out and we definitely gonna talk about it. We definitely gonna talk about it. Oh, yeah. They got so yeah. many black folk out here now that shook. They don't want to talk about race no more. Like as if racism is gone. We gonna stop talking about race when racism is done. How about that? As long as it's going on, we will be discussing it. Like, what world are y'all living in? To think, oh, well, we gotta stop talking. Why? Why we gotta stop talking about racism? For what? Just like that dumbass, I'll never forget when Morgan Freeman said that BS. He said, how do we get in racism? How do we get racism? Get rid of racism? Stop talking about it. What? Coon alert. So we supposed to pretend, excuse my French, with shit like what happened to my Arbery, we supposed to pretend that wasn't about race? We supposed to just pretend they just went after him just because and all this just happened. If we stop mentioning race, racism will go away. That has never worked and that will never, ever, ever, ever work. This is something they created, that they instituted, and that they continue to perpetuate. This entire sport right here, this country was built on that. How you gonna separate that from America? It, it can't, it can't be separated. It's an impossibility. It's an impossibility. So we will continue to speak on it. We will continue to speak up. We will continue to point it all out. I don't give a damn who like it and who don't like it. Oh, y'all make, people make, y'all make everything about race, cause it is. Cause it is, that's why, mm -hmm. cause it is. Can I say one thing real quick? Y'all forgot? No. Oh. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, nah, real quick. Uh, I forgot that. Like, it was one point that I was going to get to that I never got around to. The the black on black crime thing, right? Like, it, it's funny, yo. And I got to point this out because you just reminded me. I got to point this out. Uh, I, I hear the Kyle Rittenhouse supporters, right? And I'm listening to the Kyle Rittenhouse supporters, and, and I saw everybody saw the footage of what happened with the Kyle Rittenhouse situation, right? He was running away from an unarmed man, chasing him down. This dude, this dude was little too. This dude was like five foot three, five foot four, some he's a short dude. Like he, I mean his dude was like a little person almost. Like he was a short dude. Like he had like he was he was like five foot four, like a buck like a buck nothing. Like they didn't weigh nothing, wasn't talk nothing. Like this wasn't some big hulking, bruising type motherfucker. This wasn't, you know what I mean? He, he ain't had the ultimate warrior chasing his ass or some shit. You feel what I'm saying? He had some little runt ass motherfucking European chasing his ass and he was shook. This motherfucker had an AR-15 that was hauling ass from a motherfucking a four, five foot four nothing European wearing a buck, wearing a buck 40 nothing. Like, like, what, like, and you, he was flying, 
all in ass and he had an AR. Like this dude, but he's supposed to be Chuck Norris. Again, this, this is this is Rambo, right? This this is this sly. This is Vester Stallone, right? But he hauling ass with this little bubba. And they had to turn around and shoot him. And then shot him right on the spot. Right? Now Kyle Rittenhouse supporters. People that support Kyle. I find it funny that y'all hold this position of self-defense while bitching and crying about black-on-black crime. Because do you know if that's self-defense, then y'all got to stop crying about black-on-black crime. Because uh, do you know how much of that, them gunshots, and them motherfucking, them, 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 them motherfucking crimes, that them little shootings that happened in Chicago went down exactly the way you just saw it? Motherfuckers running up on the wrong motherfucker who got a gun and got popped? I don't hear you motherfuckers saying, oh, self-defense, self-defense, self-defense. It's no, it's these motherfuckers are criminals. It's these motherfuckers are destroying your community. It's what about black on black crime and all this other shit? Y'all don't want to hear that self defense shit? Y'all don't want to hear a motherfucker might have had to shoot his way out of a situation? Y'all don't give a fuck about none of that. It's all about the numbers, it's all about the statistics. That's what it's all about. But in this situation, all of a sudden they want to bring up self-defense arguments. He feared for his life. He had a midget. He had a big mouth chihuahua barking at him. He feared for his life and shot the little motherfucker. And then y'all turn around and call this motherfucker a hero and some kind of tough guy. I'm sorry, I'm just not impressed. That motherfucker was running, hauling ass with a fucking gun in his motherfucker right there. A run, I had a gun on him and was hauling ass from a motherfucker midget chasing him down with a paper bag with Chinese food in it. Goddamn, some motherfucking beef and broccoli. Chasing him down with beef and broccoli. He all that scared to the motherfucker. You gotta be shitting me. Do a bag of motherfucking, do a bag of motherfucking fried rice at him. And this motherfucker got scared and shook. That's what happened. And now y'all calling that shit self defense. Right. Right. Self defense. Remember that. Remember what y'all call self-defense. Because y'all about to have to retract a lot of them statements y'all made about black on black crime. And I want to see y'all advocating just as hard for those Negroes who's getting locked up for the same type of motherfucking situation that happens when it's a black motherfucker running down on another black motherfucker and y'all can use that for y'all bullshit ass talking points. I want to see y'all retract those statements Switch up y'all position. And I want to see y'all riding out for these brothers that are getting locked up for being wrongfully accused of being killers and contributing to the black on black crime statistics. That's what I would like. My bad, Renee. I had to get that point out. I forgot about that point. My fault. Go ahead, Renee. Nah, that's facts, and I totally agree. Thanks, exactly. Um, see, but here's the thing, right? They wanted this is I always man, listen. I've been talking about this for years. How when it comes to black people, they wanna in the, they wanna generalize us, but when it comes to them, it's individualized, right? So we have to be understanding of Kyle. Right? 
of what Kyle, well, Kyle did this and he was helping scrub some graffiti somebody had, had uh, sprayed on a school or on a building, right? We got to take all of this stuff into consideration for Kyle. But when y'all come with these numbers, in Chicago, it was so, so many people that got shot. The black on black crime, y'all don't sit there and go case by case and see, oh, well, in this case, this young man was, it was self-defense. Y'all don't do that. Y'all generalize everything you hear and then characterize it all one negative way about Black people. But with Kyle, we supposed to take all these exceptions and we're supposed to analyze and we're supposed to say, oh no, he was a good kid and he was actually trying to help his community. You don't do that about no Black people. You don't do that for no 17 year old Black young me. You don't do that. You don't extend them grace. You don't give them that courtesy of judging each situation one by one. You don't do that. But we supposed to do that for Kyle. He was a good kid. That beat women. That beat women. Yeah, that beat women. Yeah, nobody talks about that because they, they didn't want that admitted in the case. Because he sat up and beat a girl up. His sister was having a fight with a girl. He jumped in and beat the girl back. Yeah, he beats some girls. Yeah, he sure does. He's a thug. Kyle is a thug. He intentionally thought to go out there. He texted that dude about, hey, can I come out there? We, we're coming armed, me and my brother. We're going to come armed. Lied about being an EMT. He was with the shits that night, but then on the stand with that fake ass crime, oh, now he's the victim. That's why I said, that's the whole mentality of white people as a whole, that's their mentality. The victimizers playing victim. They go around stealing, killing, destroying then when it comes time to pay the piper, oh, I'm the victim. Well, I was just defending myself. I was, I was defending was self-defense. They were gonna take my gun and kill me with it. Well, why was you out there with a motherfucking gun in the first place? Why were you there? Well, um, well, and then here's the thing, right? People like, well, what did this got to do with race? A little color red house. What did it got to do with race? First of all, y'all need to sit the hell down. Because the whole premise of why the protest was happening in Kenosha was based off of race. It was another shooting. In this case, the brother did not um, get killed, but he's paralyzed. Where he was shot in the back seven times. Seven times in the back. And people are tired of that. And people are tired of black people being targeted. So that was the whole basis of the protest in the first damn place. Let's make that clear. Then you had the white tag alongs and the white Black Lives Matter Becky and Brad who came out there or whatever. But you got all these militia people and all these other white people, the blatant the more blatant racist who's out there and they itching and waiting to shoot and kill a black person and hey a white liberal too a white liberal too i've broken this down for people before but i'm gonna break it down again understand that in terms of white supremacy they know there will be collateral damage okay let's make that clear and part of who they feel is a buffer between them and how they really want to get at black people and maybe even other non-white people, but how they want to get at black people, which is make sure black people stay under their foot, make sure black people stay at the bottom, make sure black people are back in a, 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 a even more subservient state like during slavery. That's what they want from black people. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. That's what they want, right? And so to keep from uh, them from being in that position 
And for them to really be able to turn up on black people with without impure, I mean, just be able to straight up do it, right? That buffer is the more liberal whites, right? The more covert racist white people, right? That those people are in the middle and they want those people out the way. So in terms of these types of issues, if some of these liberal antifers gotta go, they gotta go. They gotta go because that's collateral damage. That's just gonna come with it. I guess all lives really don't matter. No, all lives don't matter. That's right. No, they don't. All lives don't matter. It's white li- it's white lives, and then when they get more specifically amongst white people, it's the right wing lives. White conservative lives matter. Right. It's white lives ultimately. Right. It's white lives ultimately. And then more specific. I could have swore he talked forever, y'all. <laughs> it's white. <laughs> and then more specifically, it's right wing with amongst white people, then it's right wing lives. Okay. So, like, this is what's going on. So, when people say this, think about, well, what did race have to do with anything? Okay, well, the basis of the protest. Do you think for one minute that somebody like Kyle Rittenhouse didn't think he was going to be able to go out here and turn up on some BLM protesters? That's why the he went out there. And now them BLM protesters turned out to be the white ones. But who cares? Who cares at that point, right? So don't come to me. Yeah, exactly, exactly race traders at the end of the day and these people just gonna be some of the ones we just gotta get up out of here and it's like my thing is like they think people are so dumb because especially black people they think we're so dumb and they say so like that well what do race got to do with it and see for people I guess who are very simple in their understanding I guess for that it works on those people that don't work over here and that don't work on our audience. That might work elsewhere. And they say, well, yeah. No, all of this got to do with that. Because they don't have to deal with each other before they can really deal with us how they want to deal with us. Right? That's why when they go around like the Charlottesville, Jews won't replace us and all this kind of shit. They got to have their internal strife and their internal struggles as well. And that's why all of these very silly, very silly, silly, ignorant black people who align with this QAnon stuff, who align with these right-wing people, you are dumb as hell. You think that aligning with them and rocking with Kyle Rittenhouse is gonna save you. That's what you think. You think not bringing up racism, like Morgan Freeman said, is gonna save you. Sweetie, you are a means to an end. You are some little coon that they can string up and act like, see, we're not against black people. As long as this black person kiss my ass and they better go along with everything I say and they better not bring up racism. As long as you don't do that, for the time being, they'll let you rock. They'll let you rock. And so these very superficial arguments, you know, that this isn't this has nothing to do with race, it's just like that's people with simple minds. Th- those are simple-minded people. Those are not people paying attention to what's going on and what's always gone on. And we really gotta get our head out the clouds. And I mean, y'all know, you know, we do different, you know, topics and things like that or whatnot, but People, people want to hear about like the gender thing, right? People want to hear certain stuff, you know? But when we talk about something like this, a lot of people don't want to hear it because it's going to come from a very hardcore, very black militant stance. It's going to come from a position of we don't support no interracial, like Psycho talked about the black men out there with Becky on them. You know what I'm saying? They got their Beckys out there. You're compromised. How in the hell are you out here repping some RBG or repping pro-blackness, repping the people, and you out here with Becky? 
just like when with the George Floyd thing, it was so many Beckyanas out there, y'all, at them protests and stuff outside of the store where he was killed and everything, and it was a bunch of no other racial women protesting. No other racial women protesting. Right, because right. I still seen a hell of a lot of white women that be out here on the front line. That's what I done seen, but you know, no other race of woman. You feel me? It was a lot. It was a hell of a lot of them out there in the George Floyd thing, but no other race of woman. Um, but you got these black people who want this kumbaya thing with um white folks. They want to be able to date them and screw them and have children with them, all while oh racism, you know, mentioning racism. But they're not serious about addressing racism. They're not serious about it because if they were, there's no way you would be aligned with somebody and you would be sleeping with somebody and having children with somebody who's white. If you were serious about addressing racism. And I want to point that out too, that a lot of these other white women that be out here too, it be some of them, the Beckyanas that call themselves uh, being in support of Black Lives Matter. But let me point something out. It's a lot of these white women who are these Trump supporters, who are these trailer trash, funky, stinking white hoes that have had babies by black men that go out there and protest for Kyle, that support all over the internet supporting Kyle Rittenhouse, that uh, low-key support uh, the people that, that killed uh, my artery. Let's keep that above. See, some people have, you know, these dudes that's out here with these Beckyanas and whatnot. Some of them have this mentality that, oh, she down with the people, right? Because she down with some Black D, right? So she down for Black... No, no. Absolutely not. That does not mean that. It does not mean that at all. And the fact that a lot of Black people think that just like you have a lot of Black women too. We found out a lot of them proud, some of them proud boys got black wives. Okay, and we know they racist as hell. And they try to pretend like, oh, we're just out here. And you know, that's the thing too, right? And I keep trying to help people to understand this. The first tenet of white supremacy is deception, okay? So you have to be deceived into believing that's not what it really is. So that's why somebody like the proud boys with all of their racism and all the stuff that they do, well, come on, well, we're not racist. We're we're just out here, you know. We're we're just you know against some of this stuff going on, and uh, and y'all some damn fools if you sit there and you accept that. You are a damn fool if you accept that. And then they put the symbol up like Kyle Rittenhouse, right? They talk about, how is Kyle Rittenhouse racist? Really? How is he not? Like I said, the basis of him going out there because he wanted to turn up on some damn BLM people. Let's make that clear. He thinks that he, because he's white, that he can be a motherfucking police officer. Just because he's white, I can just go out here and I can impose my will on who I want to impose it on. Because again, the basis of the protest was the police shooting of a black man in the back seven times, okay? That was the basis of what went on. The police do not need y'all. The police don't need y'all. Y'all want to go up there and turn up on people. Black people, BLM people, and these other white liberal people that may be out there in the mix. Let's make that clear, okay? And then when he's sitting up there in the bar taking pictures, throwing up the the OK symbol, and, and that's another thing. They play games with that. Like, nobody knows that it's supposed to be, oh, they didn't mean that. That's not what that means. <laughs> so here's the thing. If you then know that people perceive that, because y'all claim that ain't what it is, right? But if you then know that people perceive that to be a white supremacist symbol, why would you put it up? Why would you put it up? Because you already know that, so why would you take pictures doing that? 
And then people will turn around, no, they were just here, they were just, no, it wasn't. Who do you think is a fool? Who's a fool? Who's a fool here? Not me. So, you know, it's like all of these little games that's being played about this whole thing. And, and he's not racist and he's not, and like I said, it ain't about the white dude because that's white on white crime. That's white on white crime. It's about the system, how they allow certain things to go down. It's about the fact that he was out there in law enforcement, let him be out there and impose his will on whoever he wanted to impose, impose it on, as long as it was the people on the side supposedly of, of BLM. As long as it's against them, we with it. We with it, because them white people can go anyway. We can really get at these niggers, but those white people that's be, with BLM, they race traitors anyway. Like, let's keep that a buck. And then um, the police, whatever building he called himself going out there protecting, the um, they had already moved past that. That was secure one, nothing going down. So why are you still out there? Who the hell are you? See, he wanted to play Billy Badass, but then when it came to bite him in the ass, now he's the victim and he's up there with fake tears. No, you thought you was the big man out there with the gun. Be the big man now. You thought you was going out to protect and defend. Well, protect and defend now and sit up here like a real man and not do these fake ass tears without not a tear coming out of your eyes, trying to make yourself cry. You're a horrible actor. Y'all got every judgment in the world for a 17-year-old black young man. Y'all got every judgment in the world. When they come in front of these juries, they come in front of these judges, boom, the gavel goes down. They're sentenced to adult prison. They go to adult prisons. They're in the adult system. They don't get looked at as, oh, it was a teenager and he was just young and made, no, no. And they done killed two people. You done got a gun, you done premeditated going out there. You done premeditated and then they didn't want to enter into the trial where he had said before about shooting uh, uh, um, target um, looters. Talking about shooting target looters. Why couldn't that be entered into the trial? Why couldn't that be a part of the trial? That shows a state of mind. Because that shows somebody who considers themselves some kind of vigilante who can impose their justice on who they choose. So because somebody went in a motherfucking target and stole something out of there, they deserve to be shot and killed by you? So you already think you judge, jury, and executioner. You already have that mentality. So when this went down, oh yeah, you was ready because you was ready to bust some heads. You was with it. You approached them, they didn't approach you. Then nobody contact you and say, hey Kyle, you know, would you come out here? Would you want to come out and help defend the gas station or whatever the hell it was, whatever, it was a car uh, shop or what, um, mechanic shop or whatever it was. You want to come out here and defend? Then nobody hit you up. That's why I hope they roast your ass. I hope they do. I hope they do. Because if he was black, they would certainly do it. There would be no hesitation. And this system, I'm tired of these people. They get away with everything. And the only reason the other white people ain't tripping more about this white on white crime is because those people were the liberal white people. And like I said, they're already seen as the race traitors in the first place. That's the only reason why. Because the first thing they say when they see 
white a white person talking about Black Lives Matter, what's the first thing they start talking about? Oh, they got white guilt. They, this, that, and the third, blah, blah, blah. You know, everything, because, you know, white guilt is another way of calling motherfucker, uh, that's a white way of calling motherfucker a coon, right? That's, that's their way of calling motherfucker a race traitor, right? Uh, um, you know, a, a sellout, right? Like, you know, like you, you, you got, you got, you got white guilt. So, i.e., you know, you, you're caping for another race of people. That's the, that's what they're that's what they're alluding to, right? So, yeah, they definitely look at white liberals as race traitors. That's they they don't say that, but that, that's what they that's how they feel. That's how they represent, and uh, you can tell by the way they speak to each other. You know, like when they when they hear when they see a white liberal, they immediately start going after them about black black shit, right? They immediately start attacking them about black on black crime, like 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 this shit. You know, like this case right here being talked about black on black crime and talking about Chicago and all this shit when none of this shit got to do with any black people being shot in Chicago. Ain't got nothing to do with no black people or Chicago whatsoever, but that's the common talking point out there. So this is, this, this, that is going to show how racialized everybody has made their uh, little political stance. This whole thing's been politicized. It, it started off being politicized and, it's, and, you know, once it's politicized, it's going to get racialized. Cause you know uh, they they see motherfuckers black people and they immediately think that these black people are automatically liberal, right? I get that shit all the time. Motherfuckers immediately start trying to put these BLM jackets on me that I've never worn in my motherfucking life. These jackets don't even fit me, dog. But they keep trying to put that BLM jacket on me, and I keep telling them to go fuck themselves. Stop doing that shit, right? I don't support that dumb shit that's going on over there. I agree with the sentiment of Black Lives Mattering, but as far as that shit they got going on over there, trying to motherfucking make RBG flags and rainbow flags synonymous with each other, I don't fuck with none of that dumb shit. I don't fuck with none of that weirdo shit them motherfuckers over there promoting. Right? I I, I fight against the shit them motherfuckers over there promoting. They too pussy for me. They too pussy for me. That's why I laugh when you motherfuckers call them terrorist groups because BLM too pussified for me. It's a fucking joke, right? Let's get that clear. But the but the motherfuckers immediately see you black and immediately start thinking you a leftist, BLM rider, and all this other little silly nonsense. Blah 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 blah. But you saying that because I'm black. That's why black conservatives get so much attention. That's why being a black conservative is actually a popular lane, right? Because white people ain't used to seeing black people talk conservative talking points and especially a negro that's going to throw his whole race of people under the bus for a couple of dollars when so when they find these motherfuckers they embrace them and they lock into them right that's that's kind of what they do that's why you got the 10 Brandon Tatum's of the world the Candace Owens and all these other little motherfucking race hustling ass motherfucking negroes these little race hustling Negroes that ain't worth shit, ain't worth a damn. Wait up. Appreciate that, Keisha Keish. Appreciate that. Shout out to you for the super chat. Alright, appreciate that, Keisha, again. Thanks to you. But yeah. That's why you got these lanes, these popular lanes where all these coons get to pander to white people, say everything that they're thinking coming from a black voice, so therefore it holds more weight. Y'all know how these motherfuckers are. Every day I'm hustling, 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 hustling. Every day I'm hustling, 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 every day I'm every day I'm every day I'm hustling, 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 every day I'm every day I'm every day I'm hustling. You think you're fucking with, I'm the fucking boss 745, white on white, that's fucking Ross I cut them wide, I cut them long, I cut them fat I keep them coming back, we keep them coming back I'm in the distribution, 
I'm like Atlantic. I got the motherfuckers flying across the Atlantic. I know Pablo, Pablo, Noriega, the real Noriega. He owe me a hundred favors. I ain't petty, nigga. We buy the whole thing. See, most of my niggas really still deal cocaine. My roof back, roof back. My money ride. I'm on the pedal, show you what I'm running like. When they snatch black, I cry for a hundred nights. He got a hundred bodies serving up. And there y'all go, family. And there y'all go. Y'all already know. They done made a whole lane for these motherfuckers to get their hustle on, right? So, you know, they get out there, you know, they, they go and do their thing, right? Because that's their whole stick, right? Their whole stick is they black conservatives. I'm black and I don't I don't agree with all the black people. I'm the black guy that don't agree with all this. Right? Like that, that's the thing. Right? So we, we you know, we, we know we know how these motherfuckers get down. Like I said, like when you hear a black conservative talk, it's kind of like, eh, I already know what it is, but you, you's a pandering ass Negro, right? Like, you, that's just kind of what it is. I don't meet too many honest black conservatives. A couple, I met a couple. I met a couple honest ones. You know, they just conservative through policies or whatever. But that's far and in between. R rarely do you find black conservatives that are strictly about policies. Most of these motherfuckers is hustling people. Most of these motherfuckers are hustling people or they just self loathers one or the other. Yeah, that, that's very rare is it about policies. That's why most of them can't talk policies with you, right? Because they can't, everything they say is anti-left. That's all they've been trained to do is just talk shit about the left. They really can't give you no good reasons to support the right other than fuck the left. Right, and they, you know, being that they got this two-party mindset, if it's fuck the left, now, i.e., it must be, you know, let's get down with the right. That's their philosophy, and that's flawed logic. Very flawed logic, by the way. But yeah, I'll, I'll get ready to pass the mic to Renee before we get out of here. Yeah, I'm gonna just wrap it up or whatnot, because we done been on for hours but yeah y'all um we had to go in today on this because like i said it's just been a lot going on and everything i want to um do i don't know when but i want to do a show like on this whole critical race theory thing like they're using that as some little talking point now like just just so many things y'all but um yeah i hope they roast his ass um, I don't think they will, but he, he's getting some time, though. Like, he's gonna get some time. Um, most deaf. Um, and he definitely deserves that. He deserves life in prison or, or, or more. Um, but yeah, and then in the My Arbery case, they deserve the death penalty. Put them to death straight up like that. Straight up like that. Straight up like that. It ain't no way around it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, y'all, this is just, you know, we know what it is, and you have these little dumbass people, these little white people, and these other coons and stuff that make these little dumbass accounts, and they come in here and say little rhetoric or whatever, but it's very important to pay attention to that because it's the typical stuff that ha that white people in general do, which, like I said earlier, do, do things like bring up so-called black-on-black crime and stuff like that. These are their typical tactics. Um, like he, they mentioned um, Al Sharpton being a race hustler. I, I ain't, no, ain't gonna be no Al Sharpton slander tonight. Ain't gonna be no damn Jesse Jackson slander tonight. That ain't going down. That ain't happening. And it ain't because I support them at all. It's because that's not the point of what was going on. You had three motherfucking white racist bastards that killed this black man. I ain't gonna sit here and deflect this to be about no damn Jesse Jackson and no Al Sharpton. That's what y'all want. That's what y'all have. That's what y'all like to do. Y'all have a lot of black people that If we do a show specifically and we talking about them on something else, that's something different. But absolutely not. It's not going to be tolerated. Period. 
Period. Uh, shout out to Elaine. 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 She just gave a super chat. She said, uh, enjoyed the show. I'm glad y'all not talking about celebrity bullshit. Britain House getting off. I bet you $10. <laughs> I think I think the motherfucker is getting, I think he's going to do a little bit of time. I don't know if I want to put, place a bet on it, but that's what I think. But yes, and no, we didn't want to talk no celebrity. Yeah, we know about all that celebrity. Duck. Too many motherfuckers talking about that shit. I don't care. I don't care about none of that shit. Yeah, this we got serious cases going on right now. And we ain't got, yeah, it's too much going on. Be thinking about some fucking the baby and who else going through some bullshit? Uh, 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 MC died recently. Um, I ain't going to even pretend. I ain't going to hold y'all up like I was a fan of his. So, yeah, but we ain't, we wasn't, hell no, not with all this shit going on. No, I ain't talking about that shit. That shit's bullshit. My fault for that. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. No, shout out to uh, everybody who donated, everybody who listened to the show, who supported, um, everybody. We appreciate y'all so much because we know that so many of y'all rock with us. You know, people don't necessarily agree with everything because y'all know some of our stances when it comes to certain other things that have been controversial. You know, some people agree, some people disagree and whatnot, but um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we really need to address real issues that are affecting the community. And I just don't think that some of the, some of these stories that get a lot of attention among like black YouTube and black media, if you will, deserve it. Um, you know, I get it. You know what I'm saying? Cause like I said, we talk about certain stories too, but we try to always frame it into a larger picture. But some of this stuff get way too much time. And I just think that right now what's going on is like, they're trying to kind of diffuse a lot of this. Um, like Psycho said earlier, having these two trials going on at the same time. I feel like that was intentional. You feel me? Um, Tinfoil hat on, I can't prove that, but I, that's my personal belief, you know, um, that it was kind of to diffuse things. So. Y'all, we still need to be paying attention to what's going on out here because it's one thing when it's your son or your family or your brother or your loved one or your sister or your cousin, you know what I'm saying? And it can be any of us at any given time how this system operates. And then if it go down and the prosecutors and, and all the police and all of them say, oh, well, there was no crime here. It was justified. Then what? So we can't forget we can't forget what's really important and what's really going on so anyway with that we went in so I think I'm gonna tie a bow would have put a bow on it put a knot at the end I don't know put a period at the end of the sentence or whatnot but yeah so we'll be back I don't know when but um it's y'all it's some crazy stuff going on so we might have to do we probably gonna slide in some crazy celebrity thing um, in the future, cause um, yeah, it is a couple things I wanted to discuss as far as that's concerned. But oh yeah, and Psycho may touch on it um, on his show coming up. But the Malcolm X thing, y'all, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff to talk about. So I do want to address that. Uh, focused on that. Yeah. 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 Right. But anyway, y'all, I love y'all, appreciate y'all, and I will see y'all on the next one. Right, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, and yes, we got a whole Malcolm X thing, and I, I, but they already kind of, yeah, yeah, I, I might be, there's a good chance I'm gonna be talking about that on Saturday. Y'all know how I get down with that topic. I'll beat y'all heads senseless with that motherfucker. Motherfucker, <laughs> yeah, I'll be looking for smoke on that topic can't hard to find it but yeah anyways uh family if you have it already please do me a favor please click like share and subscribe it's very important that you click like it gets us in the algorithm it's also important that you share it lets people know we breathing and it's also important that you subscribe you know what i mean and after you subscribe family 
please don't forget to hit that notification bell. It's also very important to hit that notification bell. You know, you be here bright and early, be notified whenever we do go live, and you can be part of the notification game. And yeah, to my haters out there, I'm running out of time to do this because I don't know when YouTube's going to change it, but soon YouTube's going to take this away. So have at it now while you still can. If you had any issues with anything you heard today, any opinions placed or given by the host on of the show, you can now express yourself by clicking dislike. Please still share this motherfucker. It, you know, sharing is caring. And then you might want to kindly unsubscribe, right? Because if you had any problems with the opinions and views expressed on this channel, I already know you ain't on none of these right here. And some of you motherfuckers need your minds right. So y'all can, you know, so y'all can stop rocking RBG flags with rainbow flags laid up under Becky. You fucking nuts. Anyways, please consider becoming a Patreon family. If you do, you have access to any stream I do, whether I keep it up or whether I take it down. You also have access to exclusive content that I have on there. And I also have no limits on my Patreon. Whatever you feel like the channel's worth, that's what you donate. Shout out to all my Patreon out there. I appreciate all y'all. All donations given does go towards the production of the show as always. And uh, yeah, family, please follow me on Twitter and the gram and at Clubhouse. At Psychopathy is spelled the same way as the channel. And uh, also, please subscribe to all our channels. This is also very important. Because sometimes we might have to channel hop. And if we do, you want to be on top of everything we're doing. So please go to the description box. Click on all those links. And please subscribe to all those channels. And please don't forget to hit the notification bell over there as well. And uh, yeah family as always if you out there and you're looking for any uh custom designs artwork uh logos please consider hitting up our sister renee at renee black graphics on facebook also if you're looking for any t-shirts hoodies or coffee mugs all custom designs please consider hitting up her store as well. All these links, just like all the other links, will be in the description as always. And yes, family, uh, today is Thursday night, so I'll be back Saturday morning. Y'all already know where it is. Be up bright and early for my wake and bake on Saturday. Uh, be on the lookout for that. I think I probably already know what I'm gonna be talking about. Might have spilled the beans on that already. And, uh, yeah, family, as always, I want to shout out everybody out there that was listening. You know what I mean? I appreciate all y'all for coming through. You know what I mean? Shout out to everybody that was out in the live chat. Uh, appreciate all the donations given. And shout out to Mod Deep. I appreciate y'all. Uh, shout out to everybody that was just out in the clouds, just listening, being nosy. I want to give a peace and black power to everybody out there. Holla black at your boy and your girl. We out. Battle anybody, I don't care, you die. Uh, Battle uh, anybody, uh. I don't care, you die. Uh, battle anybody, uh, uh. I don't care, you die. Yeah. Battle any, battle any, battle any, battle, battle, I accept. Yeah. They yeah. are fine. Yeah. 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 Let's go. Let's go.